Bueno, muy buenas tardes, queridas y queridos ponentes. En primer lugar, participantes también nada más. Um, muy bienvenidos a este taller uh, bilingüe um, en inglés y castellano. Aprovecho y hago la introducción en inglés, aunque a mí me guste más el castellano, pero, pero uh, haré, la haré en inglés porque hay algunas personas que no de, dominan tan perfectamente uh, el, el castellano, pero que cada uno hable el idioma que mejor le convenga. A veces se pueden mezclar las slides en castellano y hablar en inglés, como hago yo, pero puede ser algo diferente. So, good afternoon. Let me give you a warm welcome. Um, um, thank you very much for joining, sacrificing a Tuesday afternoon in the middle of the week. Um, and uh, uh, we organized this workshop for our new network with President <laughs> Andres Marin of LATAM at Heiske, uh, que es un network que reúne uh, a todas las personas que de alguna manera tengan que ver con la Universidad de San Galen y con América Latina. Esta es la red que estamos montando. Um, y después también... Ah, oh, perdón, no hablo. <laughs> And we also build up today a network which is more informal still and very small in comparison, which is the network of people who work some, somehow work on Latin American visual arts uh, in Switzerland. So it's still very small, but let's see uh, how it will evolve. Um, several persons will present their thoughts, their research on Latin American art in general, Elena, for instance, will question the concept as such, Latin American art, is there such a thing? Elisi, <laughs> Elisi focuses on the border crossing of the crossings of the concept, thus gives it a transnational perspective. Uh, also, André uh, underlines counter narratives, taking the example of a, a Brazilian artist, Rodrigo. Braga. <laughs> we have our Rodrigo here, but this is Rodrigo Braga working on the Amazon rainforest. Adriana considers similar counter narratives through residual arts. And we have our own Rodri Rodrigo here with us, a Chilean artist living in Switzerland who will show us some of his work. Anatina is online from Lausanne. Anatina Erne, she treats a very uh, um, contemporary post-COVID lockdown topic, which is the increasing digitalization of the art world. And Thomas looks at the cultural implications of the art market for Latin America. And finally, Beatriz Sanchez will comment on the corporate perspective of Latin American art. Thank you, Chris. Bangfair owns approximately 5,000, more than 5,000 artworks of all of Swiss origin collected since the bank's funding, uh, founding in, in, um, in uh, 1981. Now the University of St. Gallen, and this is also why we're here, started 20 years earlier, collecting in 61, which is very early for a, let's call it corporate collection, it's an organizational collection, a public collection. And uh, we are have had more an international orientation that we also have plenty of Swiss artists. Um, we own five Latin American, oh, it doesn't work. I do it here. We own five Latin American artworks, uh, work, works the first one on the left top, uh, is surprisingly from a woman, which is really surprising because at that time in 63, uh, art was male dominated. Uh, uh, so she is an Argentinian woman, Alicia Penalba, uh, who created a passage between the old park of huge trees of the main building uh, and <coughs> the new visionary architecture of, a rectang of the rectangular cement building on our campus using um, organic forms representing the trees and 
salmon, pearl salmon representing the building. So she built this passage from the old park to this revolutionary. Moreover, we, moreover, we have two uh, Mexican-American artists, Latino, Latina artists, eight photographs of alienated cars through organic and cultural applications by Betzabe Romero, the one on the top right. Uh, and the second one is Alejandro Diaz, Happiness is Expensive, with his uh, critical attitude towards consumerism, consumerism and advertising um, uh, with neon light. That, that's why they used neon light. Then we have Mexican artist Raul Revoliedo uh, on, in the middle. Uh, I will explain the very inspiring content later if there's some time left of his artwork. And finally, we have Brazilian artist Clarissa Tosin, white marble every day. This is a two-channel video observing very closely the daily ritual of, let's call it, whitewashing, uh, uh, the cleaning of the white building of the Palace of Justice in Brasilia. Uh, even the cleaning staff is dressed in white with a white plastic boots. So it's really all white. That's why I call it whitewashing. It's a very uh, impressive video. So she filmed every day this routine of washing justice every day. <laughs> and um, she shows it in those two this two street uh, video. After the workshop at 5 p.m., I will give the people interested among you a tour through our impressive art in architecture collection worldwide unique for a public university because it's so accessible. It's part of everyday life students and uh, staff. Um, you can see, for instance, a Giacometti, a Miro, a Gapies, a Brack, an Art and a Calder. Uh, from the 60s, you can see Gerhard Richter, Kuki, Palladino from the 80s. You can see Craig, Tony Craig, Lubimbühl from the 90s, and contemporaries like Roman Siegmund, Yan Pei Min, a Chinese, Hubbard and Birchler which is also in your collection. Leutenecker, uh, Zilla Leutenecker, who is in your gallery. <laughs> and in our uh, picture, thanks to his gallery. <laughs> <laughs> and Brigitte Kovans, uh, Maitu Pere, which is in this building, he is in this building. Uh, currently, we're acquiring Maha Malou, a Saudi Arabian uh, artist from Riyadh, and uh, possibly Chabalala Sef, uh, uh, a black American from Harlem, uh, from Harlem, uh, uh, who was recently exposed in the in the art museum of mm -hmm. So it will be a pleasure to show the ones around who don't know this collection yet. And um, Betty Sanchez has already seen some of it. Um, so I will now re use my remaining 10 minutes uh, to give you some hints at Swiss initiatives fostering the international distribution and attention uh, towards Latin American art in the last one or two decades. I have briefly mentioned the most important ones in the short uh, text on the flyer. Uh, so if there is such a thing as a boom of Latin American art, in any case, a growing visibility it is. Uh, the most important market platform is no doubt uh, Basel Art Miami, Art Basel Miami, covering the whole continent, founded in 2002. In a dried up international art market with a lack of affordable supply, Miami awakens the thirst of international Hi. clients for Latin American works of their private, public, and corporate collections. Moreover, uh, the fair builds a bridge between North and South uh, on the continent. An important non-for-profit catalyst was Dado's collection, whose fate is not clear, I say was, because his fate, whose fate is not clear since the owner, Uch Mihaini, since her sudden death. The heirs do not know yet what they will do with this incredible collection, uh, also covering a whole, the whole continent let alone the transnational library of books and catalog uh, at its Zurich he headquarters. It is the largest uh, library of um, in Europe on, that, uh, on contemporary Latin American cars, 1,500 monographs and catalogs, not arranged according to countries. 
On the contrary, art libraries and collections in Latin America always tended to collect nationally, while that was really collected across all uh, the countries. Visiting that library in Zurich was always an overwhelming Pan-American uh, experience. The only person taking care currently of Dado's collection is Walter Sopelsa, who unfortunately is in Lebanon and Jordan right now at this moment, so he can't be with us, with us but he would have loved to participate because he feels somewhat isolated in his lonely task. Uh, of taking care of this Dados collection. Dados even opened a huge museum in Rio uh, of more than 11,000 square meters. It's, it was huge. Uh, Casa Dados, which unfortunately they closed down again after two and a half years. Uh, it was from March uh, 2013, uh, 2013 to um, December 2015. I was there twice, uh, uh, an incredible, incredibly beautiful space after an impressive restoration of a neoclassical building, a former orphanage, orphanage at the beginning of the 19th century for girls, uh, and then a school, and it was sold to Dados in 2006 by Santa Casa de Misericordia. <laughs> the private collection, one of the most significant of uh, of runs of Latin American contemporary art in the world, got started in 2000 by Rich Mitheini and contains over 1,100 artworks from 120 artists of all genres from beginning of the 60s until uh, recently, until today. The Dados Catalyst supports a sense of group, of Pan American belonging company artists moving out of the purely national sphere into transnational practices. The third Swiss impulse, which has fueled that market, that mark, not the market, that mark boom, uh, financed by UBS, uh, the bank, the headquarters in New York, was also quite impressive in cooperation with the Guggenheim Museum in New York, Guggenheim UBS map global art initiative, it was called, and the exposition under the same sun, art from Latin America today, starting in 2014, curated by Pablo Leon de la Barra, with 40 contemporary artists of 15 countries, and then toured through the subcontinent. That was really impressive, that they really toured this exposition. Uh, curator Pablo Leon de la Barra was at the conference on Latin American art for UBS clients, collectors, art professionals, very nearby San Gallen at Wolfsberg, the UBS research campus. So he was there and also uh, Ella Fontanares de Cisneros, whom you probably know, <laughs> was there too at Wolfsberg uh, and fulfilled similar parallel functions to the Dados collection herself with a transnational biography commuting between Cuba, Miami, Venezuela, Madrid. So it was really nice to have that was a similar situation, you know, a gathering in Switzerland of a, a couple of uh, uh, people representing uh, initiatives in Latin American art. On a smaller scale, at the moment, the initiatives in Switzerland itself uh, are also worth mentioning several expositions of Latin American artists at Peter Kirchmann. Uh, for instance, um, that were the, the initiatives I just showed, so Art Basel Miami, Dados, etc. And this is one of the main artists exposed uh, at uh, the Kirchmann Gallery, uh, Teresa Margolias. She's one of my favorites, um, Mexican. Uh, Thomas surely will tell us some more on the promotion of Latin American artists at Greece. At the Bayla Museum in Basel, we, saw, we have seen works of Dados collection because Bayla and Dados were frequenting at a certain uh, moment. And, um, and but recently we saw Doris Salcedo. And last but not least, I would also like to mention the art award for Colombian artists uh, where Betty Sanchez is part of the jury and will surely comment on it, I guess. Then we have the May 36 gallery also in Zurich, which is called, currently showing two Cuban artists, Michel Perez Pollo and who lives in Madrid and Raul Cordero probably. Uh, Adriana knows about this too. 
And um, what about Latin American artists living and working in Switzerland? We have one representative here uh, today with us, Rodrigo, who will tell us about the specific constellation, working conditions, distribution of his art pieces, living in the Kunststadt, in the art city of Basel. You can see that the campaigns in favor um, of the Latin American visual arts from tiny Switzerland alone are considerable and they are evidence of a certain curve. Um, one can wonder whether this is all a mere coincidence um, at, the, at the main art Basel fair in Basel in June of this year, Latin America was very well represented, both artists and galleries. I counted galleries, 20 Brazilians, 30 Mexican, um, nine Argentinian, makes a total of 42. I mean, this is a considerable, considerable number in the main art Basel. I mean, we're not talking of art Basel. Really. Of course, there are far more international drivers uh, that have fueled the growing attention towards Latin American art worldwide. So the intercontinental circulation and distribution of visual arts follow a rather capricious course. The 21st century has seen a changing of the guard. I mean, I come originally from literature and there the boom was in the 60s and it lost momentum in the, above all in Europe. I mean, I'm not talking of all the region of the world, but in Europe, Latin American literature in comparison to the boom years of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, has lost uh, uh, momentum and, and is decreasing in Europe, above all in the German part, in the German-speaking countries, uh, has lost, uh, has decreased uh, uh, dramatically. Uh, so we have the two spheres, the literary and the visual, they have taken turns, so they have switched roles. Practically. And it seems that almost always the international demand comes from outside. The peninsula's literary boom to compensate from an absent baron, literary scene during Franco's dictatorship, was promoted by great women, art agents, above all in Barcelona, the, what, what the most prominent one, uh, Carmen Barcells. Now, one wonders whether this does not. <laughs> conceal a mere market-oriented, external, even Eurocentric attitude, that is to say whether the stimuli really came mainly from outside, whether local artists have not rather acted independently, and whether transformations from within did not arise too on the side of production, supply and dissemination, promoting a change from a national to a transnational orientation with a growing nomadism of artists. As the last century shows, the aesthetics of literary modernism at the end of the 19th century in the young nations that had freed themselves uh, one after the other from the colonial yoke was the first school born on site, aesthetically independent, so to speak, since the arrival of European colonialists. The Mexican moralists, this was uh, Boris Salcedo with her impressive work, uh, Palimpsesto which was also exposed in Madrid several years ago, uh, uh, talking of uh, refugees. Those are the two Cuban artists at my uh, Sexual Nice Gallery. This is very short, uh, said the Mexican muralists, who along with the two women artists, Frida Kahlo and Tina Modotti, also have their own Latin American artistic aesthetic school or movement in the first half and middle of the 20th century. There has been an internal demand there for local currents. For example, in the case of the Mexican minister uh, of culture, Jose Vasconcelos, from the beginning of the 20th century, who actually promoted muralism. The two arts, verbal and visual, take turns in terms of international attention. During the literary boom of the 70s, uh, of the 60s, there were only a couple of individual cases of visual artists that achieved international renown, but did not form a school, remained in a national sphere. Uh, strictly, for example, Guayasimin in Ecuador, or Botero in Colombia, Wilfredo Lam in Cuba, and Roberto Mata in Chile, or Luis Camnitzer in Uruguay. There was a Latin American strand, uh, not born in Latin America, in situ, but taking the reins 
from a certain moment onwards, kinetic art, which we would call a, a movement or a school, we could call it. It, 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 its origins came from abroad, from Alexander Calder, from Jean Tangeli, but Carlos Cruz Diaz, Hernán Soto, or Julio Lefac became very well known and really imposing kinetic art. And in the last few decades, a whole series of established have been joined by more and more every year. To name but really a few uh, prominent among the established ones, Vic Moniz and Sildo Meirelles from Brazil, Julio Lefar and Guillermo Critica and Viviana Porto from Argentina, Alfredo Ja from Chile, Doris Salcedo and Nadine Ospina from Colombia. How did the agents of transatlantic European circulation and dissemination interact? To what extent has the Miami Fair been decisive in awakening interest in works from the subcontinent with a Eurocentric market-oriented market attitude while maintaining local and at the same, uh, same time transnational patterns of exchange? How much autonomy have artists gained? How much of a voice of their own in transformations from within the production, supply and distribution side? And how were we, and, and how and where are they still bound to by European or US canons? Let's try to comment on these questions uh, of Western canon during this afternoon and how we should conceive this generalizing, generalizing label of Latin American art. So thank you very much for your attention, comments, uh, or questions are most welcome. Uh, what I could quickly do if I have some time before uh, passing the floor uh, with great pleasure to uh, Mitokaya, Betty uh, Sanchez, we could quickly go back to um, Raul Rebolledo, this one, in the middle, uh, he is a Mexican artist. What he did, he chose three white panels, empty, and set the price for those in 10,000 pesos. But very small in the middle of all the three panels, you see the equivalent, uh, incrustated, the equivalent of 10,000 pesos in grams of cocaine, in uh, bullets, and the minimum wage of Mexico. So he really um, he he works against he works against uh, the stereotypes uh, uh, of external stereotypes. Hi, external stereotypes stereotypes towards Mexico for students of the business school uh, where we are here. Uh, but he also criticizes the art pricing procedures which are totally arbitrary. So I think it's not a very well-known artist, it's an emerging artist, but for the students, it's a, an important message uh, which we can transmit. So any questions? I think there are not too many questions because we will discuss later. Uh, yeah, I mean, I will ask you questions, you will ask me questions because it's still an informal, as I said, circle. So I'm really eager to pass the floor. Uh, to Betty Sanchez, we won't present the speakers because you have all uh, the list of uh, CVs uh, with you, so you can go in the in the in the order of the speakers. You can follow them. Um, so I'm really glad to pass uh, the word to you uh, and listen to your. We have already started to talk a little bit to your professional approach to art. Uh, in the context of this curated art collection of art. Yes. Um, so where is Latin America present in the Swiss, broader Swiss collection uh, and in the Swiss banking context, which is more important. So a warm welcome to you, Betty Sanchez, and thank you very much for dedicating this whole afternoon to our small informal gathering and to the hopefully fruitful exchange we will all share. Thank you very much for that introduction, Edith. And I am so honored and so humbled to be here in front of this audience among art historians, artists, art specialists. I am none of the above. I just happen to be a girl from Havana who grew up in the US, who fell in love with Latin America 
because I had no home, who fell in love with art. And for me, it's all been a process of self-awareness and of learning and of following my heart. And so um, I'm also very privileged to work for a great institution called Julius Baer. We're the second largest bank in Switzerland today um, by market cap, but we also have art in our DNA. And one of the things that I enjoy the most, apart from being region head of the Americas and a responsible for our business um, in the region and being on the executive board of the bank, I'm also on the art committee. So I get to spend the bank's money buying fantastic art. Um, but I think what I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit first about me and how I came to the process of being an art collector. Um, falling in love with Latin American arts. And I'm very interested to hear what you have to say because I have many battles with myself about are we doing ourselves a disservice labeling it Latin American art um, because we are so different in this wonderful region. Um, and then I'll talk about the corporate collection and how I am blending our corporate DNA with my passion for Latin America and especially female artists in Latin America that need so much more representation and what as we do the Latin America. But first, let me talk a little bit about me. As I mentioned, I was born in Havana, um, left after the revolution, was raised in the US, um, and then got married, moved to Switzerland. Um, I fell in love with two very important things happened in my life that really got me to where I am today with my passion for the region and my passion for art in the region. The first thing is my passion for Latin America. I was studying chemistry and biology at the university. I was gonna be a doctor. And then I had an existentialist crisis. And I realized that that was what my father wanted me to do, not what I wanted to do. So I went to my father and I said, I don't wanna do this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but sort of testing rats in laboratories is not my personality. So I need to figure something else. And my mother, very smart lady said, you need to just go away for a little bit. And um, she sent me off to Venezuela with her best friend. And that is where I got to know Latin America. Because before that, I was raised in Miami and we would go to Europe, but we wouldn't go anywhere in Latin America. I think my father never wanted to go back. Um, and I fell in love with the region. And I said to myself, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with my life, but whatever it is, it has to be with Latin America. Because that filled the hole, the nostalgia I had of not having a country, of not being able to go to Cuba or the Cuba that I knew from my parents' memories was not the Cuba that existed. So that was number one. Whatever I did, I had to be true to Latin America and I'm very proud of myself. My whole career has been dedicated to the region. The second thing was how I got into art. So got married, had children living in Switzerland and uh, we were at dinner one night and my son must've been about four at that time. My daughter was about seven. And my son, very precocious, he says to me, mommy, in French, he says, what are we? Are we Cuban? Are we American? Are we Swiss? Are we nothing? And as a mother, to hear your child say that was for me very earth shaking. And I thought, oh, okay, we need to give our children roots. And what better to say, all right, let's start with Cuba because my husband is also Cuban. Let's start with Cuba and what best, let's start with culture, let's start with art. And that's where we literally taught ourselves. And I tend to have a little a bit of an obsessive personality. So I became much, much more involved in it than my husband. But we started to learn about Cuba and about the richness of art in the region. And as I got to know more and more about the Cuban movements, whether that was the Vanguardia movements of the 30s to the 60s, right before the revolution, whether that was the Volumen Uno, which was the Big Bang, hopefully, we thought at the time in the early 80s of Cuban art as things were looking like they were starting to open up culturally, but then it ended up not. Um, and just taking it from there into the art that is being produced today, both in Cuba and outside of Cuba. Um, gradually, I sort of graduated from Cuban art to really Latin American art. And what I find so fascinating about art in our region is the fact that it's really a reflection and a story of our society and our history. 
art in Latin America started before the first Spaniard or the first Portuguese or the first Viking ever set foot. We had the Aztecs, the Incas, we had the tribes that really were indigenous to our areas that really created some wonderful murals. Muralism did not start with the Ibrahimeda in Orozco. It started with the Aztecs and the Indians and the Mexicas and so many others, right? And it's not just a Mexican art form. It is a Latin American art form. Um, and then you go from the, the indigenous art to then the colonial art, the religious, the spiritual art, to then with the, the 1800s and the entire turning away from that colonialism and the revolutions, et cetera, to protest art and to the influences that Fauvism and expressionism and impressionism had in our Latin American cultures, because we forget that there was so much exchange between Europe and Latin America. And then you had the migrations of Africans that came in and really made it quite unique. So I fell in love with all of that movement, all of that energy. And for me, art really started in the 1920s um, in Latin America because the early 20s, or they say the 21st century was such a dynamic century. It was a century of independence. It was a century of revolutions. It was a century of political discontent. It was a century of trying to find our space culturally, socially, economically against many of the movements that were going on internationally. And I am an avid collector um, of Latin American art. Um, and I really believe that right now the next step is how can we do much more to promote especially female art in Latin America? Because we know the Frida Kahlo's, we know the Teresa Margones, who's wonderful, who I've had the pleasure of meeting but we've had so many amazing Brazilian female artists and Mexican female artists and Chilean, et cetera. But the kind of art today that is being produced by women in Latin America is very much a protest art. It's very much an art from the gut. It's very much, here's the voice of the people that suffer all the inequities of our societies, that suffer with the children, that suffer the lack of education, that suffer the lack of opportunities, and yet, not only is it angry, but it's also hopeful. And I think that is what I find so fascinating. And that is where I come back to, how do I put the corporate with my passion for Latin America to work? So as I mentioned before, I am a member of the art committee at Julius Baer. Julius Baer has existed over 132 years. Um, Mr. Baer founded the bank, but the Baer family was always very artistic and they always were very important collectors of art. As a matter of fact, a few of the members of the Bear family were artists in their own right, especially the women. And in 1981, Hans Bear donated the art collection that the family had to the bank. So in 1981, we start to really start a corporate collection. And they were very philanthropic and our mission is to promote young Swiss artists. So we try to find them young and then we follow their career throughout their history. We have over 5,000 pieces, as Yvette mentioned. We believe very much similar to here, to the university, that art is for public view, that art needs to be shared. And so in every single office that we have around the world, we have a part of our collection present. And we like to stimulate dialogue between our employees, our clients, and the art. We bring artists to talk to our people, to talk to our clients. We're always doing something to promote Swiss art. And what do I mean by Swiss art when it comes to our collection? You're either born in Switzerland and live and work in Switzerland or live and work anywhere else, or you're born somewhere else, but you live and work in Switzerland. There's got to be a Swiss connection. Um, and we have some great Chilean Swiss artists in our collection, and we have a few others. Um, we have a, rainy, a, a wonderful Iranian woman, Shirana Shabazi, who you know as well, who also lives and works in Switzerland. And we do a variety of media. We do everything from the traditional to the not so traditional. And I think one of the challenges that we have building a corporate collection and especially promoting young artists is that we need to balance between being avant-garde, being open-minded and giving everyone a space to express themselves and the conservative nature of a corporate 
your collection? And then how do you make sure you don't hurt anyone's sensibilities? Um, how do you make sure you expand their minds as opposed to having them come and say, why did you buy this horrible piece of art that's on my office wall? Uh, but we manage. And now let me talk about how I bring that into a Latin American perspective. Um, as I mentioned, um, being passionate about art, passionate about the fact that women need a greater voice. Um, being a woman and growing up professionally when usually I was the only for women to be heard, especially in our region. And especially during COVID times, if it was hard for just artists in general, it was even more difficult for Latin American female artists. I'm a very good friend of the curator and the director of the Museo de Arte Moderno de Bogota, Mambo. And she's an amazing woman. She's also an artist. And what she tries to do with that museum, which was originally managed actually by the first wife of Botero, um, she has tried to make this a museum that is available to the masses. It's in the center of Bogota. It's not the best of locations. It's not safe, but it has a collection of over 500 and some pieces ranging from Picasso's to all kinds of other things that you would not imagine sitting in a vault. And how do you bring that to the masses so they start to appreciate the beauty of art? And so she and I decided, especially during COVID, that we wanted to support female artists. And so um, with the help of the curator of our Julius Baer art collection, Barbara Schaubli, we set up the first Julius Baer Latin American Female Art Prize. We give it every two years. And we have a jury that is composed of the curator of the Mambo, but also the curators of different museums in Latin America. And we try to change those curators every, every other year to bring new perspectives. And so we create a jury. Each member of that jury needs to present three women artists or female artists that they feel is interesting. And then we bring it down to the last three um, that everybody agrees with. And then we reach out to these women to see whether they would like to produce something for us that then we would judge and have the winner. And it's a 25,000 Swiss franc prize. We also support a salon in the museum and they then whatever they decide to present, they will exhibit for six months in the Mambo and then we will take them around the different capitals of Latin America to show their art, to promote them. We also promote them on social media. We promote them by publishing books and publishing articles to really try to bring these women much more of a voice and much more attention. The first year we had Bolus Bajarpa, a Chilean artist, who um, was very, very moved by what happened a few years ago, the 19th of October in Chile, which really moved the needle there from a social perspective. And her whole exhibition was on that. It was on female voices for justice. And recently we had just now uh, Ana Gallardo, an Argentine artist who um, was very, very moved by the disappearance of women in the uh, Guatemalan civil wars. And um, her exhibition, which just closed at the Mambo, is called uh, Te Busco en Otro Nombre. And it's how so many times these women had to basically call themselves another name just to stay away from violence, from rape, and from disappearing. Um, very, very strong. But the idea, and this is where a corporate collection with the realities of Latin America come to blend so well, um, we want it to be strong. We want it to move the needle. We don't want it to be safe. Art should not be safe. Um, and especially in our region in Latin America where life is anything but safe. And I believe art is a reflection of the soul of the nation. It has to be bold. And um, this is our contribution as a Swiss safe conservative bank to the boldness of what is art and to the boldness of what is the region of Latin. So that's my story, um, and um, hope I was able to share some insights as to uh, how we do things and uh, the passions that drive us. So, okay. Okay, absolutely open for questions. I have one comment. Uh, your story of immersion into Latin America through art made me think of Ubisoft. 
Let me see. Yes, this is yes, yes. He went in 1973, the first European person or Western person. Uh, uh, he went to, to uh, China uh, with Schindler at that time, and he said, I have so much pain in entering this culture, so I decided to start collecting art to get some access to this Chinese culture, which was, and I think it's very similar. For me, it was more, how do I bring back the culture I lost yeah. um, into my family and into my life? And it became really a process of discovery. And it started with Cuban art, because obviously mm -hmm. I'm Cuban, mm -hmm. um, but one thing led to another. And, and now I must say, I am really focused on Swiss art, especially female artists yeah. in Switzerland, because the Swiss art scene here is absolutely amazing as well. It's different, but yet it isn't really. Um, everything has its, its own personality, but yeah. And Cuban art for me was a real discovery because we started with the easiest, which was the Vanguardia movement mm -hmm. of the 30s, 40s, up to I think the oldest piece we have of the one got one Vanguardia movement is Acundo Bermudas of 1959. So it was right at the revolution. Um, and then we skipped to sort of the, the Volumen Uno crowd, which really tried to open up art. It was so structured in the 70s and the 80s in Havana. You had to paint what the government told you to paint. And these people, and I'm sure you know them, it's Tomas Sanchez, Julio Larraz, Ana Mendieta, Ruben Torres Garcia, and a couple of, and Jose Bedia, who now is very active in Miami. They just really wanted to open it up and test the waters and see how much they could push the envelope. And of course, after four years, they were shut down. And many of them left Cuba. As a matter of fact, most of them left. And now they're artists in their own rights internationally. So that was sort of a failed attempt to really bring art to a different level. And then um, lastly was a few years ago when artists really tried to break the mold again. They, well, they did with the Carpinteros and Rigoberto Gonzalez and all of that crowd in the sort of 2010s, 2020s. But now if you're an artist in Cuba, unfortunately, you need to sign up with the Ministry of Culture. They need to approve your art. And if they don't approve your art, you're not an artist. And so that's very frustrating. I think this is why Ella von Banaz went to live to Cuba for a certain time to really support uh, local artists. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, she was jumping from Madrid to Miami to, but she did, and Venezuela, but she decided to go to Cuba and live there and support the art scene. I thought that was really meritorious at that time. It was like about 10 years ago. Yes, that's that's right. it was possible. Yeah, but not now. Unfortunately, no. Um, it's, but we, we keep faith that eventually again, because Cubans are very creative. So, so I don't want to talk anymore, but no, once you get me talking about this, I don't But there's perhaps a question. I mean, no, next, the next one is Cuban. The next speaker is Cuban. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So it's Adriana Lopez Labourdet. She is professor at the uh, at the University of Zurich. So your same city, uh, and uh, she has also worked in St. Gallen for many years. And um, um, I will say <laughs> the language. Yeah, and we go to Spanish. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, a, a technical one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Cuba. Bueno, no voy a hablar, bueno, eh, no de Cuba, no, no, no voy a hablar de Cuba porque es el lugar en que todo el mundo espera que yo lo eh, Bueno, eh, primero que todo, muchas gracias a Ivette. Eh, eh, muchas gracias también a los organizadores, eh, no solamente por propiciar esta suerte de encuentro eh, informal y a la vez muy formal, eh, eh, en torno a cómo pensamos, o cómo observamos, cómo apoyamos o no 
eh, la producción de arte latinoamericana y su recepción. Eh, es un placer, particularmente eh, para mí, por estar aquí, en, estar aquí en San Galen, y es un placer doble. Primero, porque he trabajado en esta universidad más de 12 años, eh, dando clases, investigando. Yo diría que productivamente, pues, eh, empecé justo después del doctorado y me fui justo después de la habilitación, y bueno, estoy ahora en Zurich. Eh, doble decía primero, porque me permite regresar a un espacio particular, pero también porque me permite de alguna manera devolver lo poco que se puede devol devolver en términos eh, de reflexión, algo a el Leading House para América Latina, que tiene su sede principal en la Universidad de San Galen y su directora a mi izquierda. No, eh, ex, se, ex, ex, ex directora. <risa> bueno, igual, para mí hay cosas que no cambian. Bueno, eh, y este proyecto, eh, como decía, fue financiado en, eh, por el Leading House, llevaba el título de Gestiones Literarias y Estéticas de Excedentes, Basura y Restos. Perdón, se me mudó un segundo. Del que o el que finalizamos con este libro, perdón, <risa> con este libro, eh, que después pasaré para que lo vean, precisamente con algunas reflexiones sobre el tema del que voy a hablar hoy, que ya no es un tema para mí, pero sí es algo, digamos, totalmente, quizás un poco atrevido esto de venir a hablar con gente especialista en, en arte visual, porque yo no soy explicado. Entonces, eh, lo que voy a presentar hoy, eh, de alguna manera, fija desde el principio un marco, y ese marco es lo reciente. Y es aquí entonces que voy a ir, bueno, este es el libro, eh, y eh, lo que me interesa más o menos hacer es ver tres ejemplos particulares eh, en relación con la cuestión de la relación o la tensión bastante compleja y bastante ambivalente entre arte y recibo. Pero empecemos por lo más elemental. ¿De qué hablamos cuando hablamos de residuos? En términos generales, llamaremos residuo a todo aquello que haya sido expulsado de un sistema, ya sea de producción, de pensamiento, de estructuras sociales o culturales. Importa aquí tanto la espacialidad como la, eh, como la temporalidad. Allí donde, como proclamaba Mary Douglas en su estudio, en su muy conocido y muy criticado eh, estudio antropológico, Pureza y Peligro, el residuo se puede definir como materialidad fuera del lugar. Pero al mismo tiempo, el residuo supone una dimensión personal, eh, perdón, temporal. En tanto tiempo, fuera del tiempo, eh, en tanto, materia que se resiste a pasar. Dentro del pensamiento filosófico, y aquí hago un panorama, hablo un poco del panorama, eh, dentro del pensamiento filosófico cultural, el concepto de residuo puede ser rastreado en una constelación marcada por cuestiones relativas a la historia o la historiografía, a las culturas de la memoria, a la ecocrítica, a la escena psicoanalítica o a la, o a la lógica neoliberal. Emergen aquí conceptos, y doy una suerte de bibliografía muy básica, eh, emergen aquí conceptos afines como desechos y anacronismos, en el punto, exformas, cronografías eh, y compostables de las artes visuales, segundo, residuos y restos de memoria o restos mnemónicos, espacios de basura y espacios de excepción, así como culturas residuales y basurización simbólica. Evidentemente no tengo el tiempo, esto nos llevaría a un seminario, digamos, completo, eh, pero eh, conforman la, parte, la base de lo que voy a estar diciendo o pensando. Acercarse a lo descartado, a lo, a lo residual, supone entrar en un proceso de desfamiliarización que empieza en su definición, que como veremos es bastante difícil, y que prosigue con la reflexión y la crítica en torno a cómo ciertos materiales, 
prácticas, regiones, comunidades y saberes son valorados o devaluados, desechados o fetichizados, expulsados o y reintegrados a un sistema. De esto se encargan, de esto se encargan los estudios de Descartes. Los estudios de Descartes. Y cito una suerte de autodefinición que pueden encontrar en su página. Como decía, se definen como campo de investigación interdisciplinar que toma como tema de estudio los sistemas de residuos y de filfarro, yendo más allá de las nociones convencionales de basura y desperdicio. Fin de cita. Esto, estos estudios no solo expanden y diversifican nuestra mirada sobre los residuos y sus correspondientes sistemas, sino que al mismo tiempo suspenden los mecanismos asociados a la reología del arte. Eh, es decir, devuelven la materia estética a los, efectos, a los efectos del tiempo. Unidos a los estudios de materialidad, estos nos permiten pensar los sistemas de diferenciación, valoración y expulsión o reintegración que acompañan a dichas materialidades y para nosotros al proceso de estetización. Eh, el uso de residuos en el arte no es ni nuevo ni particular para el arte latinoamericano contemporáneo. Muchos son los exponentes de esta serie que podríamos llamar estéticas residuales, y aquí tenemos también un reporte. Sin duda alguna, la obra más conocida, o las obras más conocidas de esta eh, de, este, eh, de estas estéticas residuales corresponden a la serie Retratos Tulish del artista brasileño Viz Muniz. Se trata de una serie de obras comentadas y también cuestionadas hasta el exceso. No voy a aportar nada más. Pero sobre el fondo de esta serie me gustaría comentar otras obras de diferente circulación y acogida desde el público y la crítica. La fisiología del gusto de Adam Vallecillo, de Banana Man, de John Hansen, eh, François Boclet, y En el aire, que acabo eh, de enterarme que puedo otra vez verla directamente, eh, de Teresa Martínez. Los tres artistas insertados de maneras diferentes en los círculos de arte de su mercado llevan adelante un trabajo con los residuos de formas dispares, como veremos los une la elección del museo o la galería como lugar de exposición de sus, pie de sus piezas, tensionando el vínculo de sus obras residuales con ese espacio en apariencia vaciado, eh, pero que aún funciona como un lugar de autorización y protección del arte. Primera pieza. La fisiología del gusto de Adán Vallecino. Cientos de, mola, de molares cariados y rotos sobre una bandeja de metal rayado clínicamente limpia. Ambos elementos, bandeja y dientes, son presentados sobre un pedestal negro de algo más de un, de, de un metro, que no solo eleva la pieza a la altura del espectador medio, sino que crea un efecto de levedad, de suspensión. Ahí están flotando ante, ante el espectador partes abyectas del cuerpo, Aquello íntimo que ha sido extraído y desechado en un primer momento para luego ser expuesto. La potencia de la instalación está, creo, en los, contrast en los contrastes varios que la proximidad de muelas, de muelas y bandeja presenta. Contrastes de texturas, de colores, de vitalidad y, por supuesto, y para mí particularmente interesante, de origen. La pieza suscita inmediatamente la reactivación, el reenactment, de una memoria común y dolorosa, la extracción de la muerte. Sin embargo, el origen, por su parte, agrega a esta primera lectura, a esta suerte de comunidad, otra definida por un territorio y una eh, cultura particular que ha sido nombrada también en Las muelas servidas en la bandeja 
han sido extraídas a individuos de la comunidad indígena de Lenca. Eh, en la comunidad indígena de Lenca que, con, que comparten con vida y eh, el Salvador. Eh, una de las zonas más pobres de Honduras y El Salvador durante las visitas de las brigadas médicas evangélicas a dicha región. De modo que los molares funcionan como índice al aparato necropolítico y de destrucción de las vidas de una región, de sus índices de pobreza y del abandono o la basurización de las vidas precarias. Significados que en su ambivalencia se acoplan al título la fisiología del gusto. Con este se abre otra dimensión más abstracta y a la vez más física, más clara y también más ambigua, pero en todo caso punzante. El funcionamiento del cuerpo humano en relación con el sentido del gusto, pero también con el gusto en términos de convención estética y social. La contigüidad entre materia y cuerpo y experiencia se da tanto para la colectividad tenenta como para el espectador en el museo y es esa doble memoria la que crea una empatía entre ambos, pero también una distancia. Pasamos a la próxima. Eh, Jean-François Boucle, de Banana Man, instalación en Francia también eh, fue acompañado por un reporte, ¿no? en, entre el 2009 y el 2012. 300 kilogramos de bananas de exportación con incisiones hechas por el artista sobre una base de material. Esta es la declaración de, de ingredientes. La banana, como sabemos, es uno de los productos del sur global más vendidos en todo el mundo, pero también es uno de, las, es una de, las, de, las, eh, de los productos más cargados de valor simbólico en toda una acumulación de sentidos que encontramos en la asociación banana, órgano sexual masculino, las repúblicas bananeras, el salvaje, el mono, desde eh, el mono que se alimenta del plátano, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. De hecho, el Banana Man es un, es un pequeño dibujo animado donde, bueno, que imita un poco el superhéroe y, por supuesto, se transforma en superhéroe al comercio. Lo cual tiene todos unos sentidos también eh, culturales muy, muy evidentes, digamos. En, la banana ha estado presente en las artes y la literatura latinoamericanas desde mediados del siglo XX como símbolo de la explotación de la industria bananera y de las rebeliones en su contra. En este caso se trata de bananas producidas en la isla de Martinica, de donde viene el artista, unas para ser consumidas y otras, no pocas, para alimentar los enormes vertederos de nuestro consumo acelerado. En la instalación de Boclé, las cáscaras de las frutas están surcadas, ahí les puesto, ¿no? eh, por palabras que aluden, con no poca ironía, al comercio y al valor de la fruta. Poética bananera, libertad o bananas, consontua, caniba, cariba, caraiba, slaut my legs, toxic colony, etc. Siguiendo ese hilo de la materia por el que abogan los estudios de materialidad, recordemos que los cortes en la cáscara tienen como efecto la aceleración de su descomposición, estado hacia el que se transformará naturalmente la materia este pisar. Las bananas, materialidad ennoblecida por la acción de la estética y el consumo, se impone aquí en toda su vitalidad incontrolable. Es esa vida recalcitrante, esa materia vibrante que continúa más allá de su consumo, lo que la pieza pone en primer plano. De su dulzura y sus efectos positivos para la salud, las, las frutas devienen materia viscosa, perdón, espero que me... Devienen materia viscosa, eh, 
y repugnante residuo de la pieza. Reafirma esta idea el hecho de que, y es bastante curioso, en una versión posterior eh, de el performance y la instalación, el artista contratara a un basurero para que al final de la eh, exposición recogiera la basura y la pusiera en los contenedores, no de arte, sino de basura. Al valor simbólico de la pieza, en su alusión a la esclavización histórica, tanto de vidas como de tierras, a la relación entre clase y mercado, entre consumo y descarte, según un, según un sentido literal o un sentido material que asimila la descomposición natural de la materialidad a los procesos de valoración o devaluación de la Realizando el rizo, podríamos pensar que la descomposición del Banana Man como héroe tropical corresponde también a la descomposición de la Tercera pieza, y con esto se Bueno, eh, creo que ya todas la hemos visto, pero igual vuelvo a insistir en el aire, Teresa Margolies, entre 2009 y 2014, que le en varias ocasiones, en varias ocasiones, la artista mexicano, mexicana ha declarado que su labor estética se basa en un trabajo con lo que queda. Y es precisamente lo que queda. La acepción primera que le otorga el diccionario de la Real Academia de la Lengua Española al vocablo residuo. Este aparece como materialidad sensoria, diría yo de varias violencias, la de los asesinatos, la del Estado incapaz de controlarlos y, de alguna forma, la de la autopsia. La declaración de materiales afirma que las burbujas han sido producidas con agua usada en la morgue para lavar los cadáveres de personas asesinadas. Ahora bien, como ha declarado su crítico, su crítico, Cuauhtémoc Medina, el agua con la que el espectador tiene un contacto directo a través de las burbujas ha sido lavada, purificada e higienizada. De ella han desaparecido, en realidad, los restos de los cadáveres de personas asesinadas. El arte residual, y aquí vuelvo a salir un poco una cuestión más teórica, siguiendo la propuesta de Walter Moser, lleva adelante dos operaciones con la materialidad. La reutilización y el reciclaje. Allí donde la reutilización conserva el objeto tal y como fue usado antes del descarte, o por lo menos nos permite reconocerlo, el reciclaje, al dirigirse a la pura materia, desprende los sentidos originales para resignificar, resignificarlos en un nuevo objeto con una nueva función. Dicha distinción, mayormente obviada en los elogios, pero también en las críticas a esta instalación, abre nuevos y pertinentes horizontes de sentido. El agua, eso que está presente como materialidad, ha sido reciclada en el movimiento de la morgue al museo, eliminando en ese movimiento la materialidad abierta de los cadáveres. Volviendo a la declaración de la pieza de Mar la declaración de Margolles, a la declaración de la pieza de Margolles, podríamos preguntar, ¿qué es aquí lo que queda? ¿Son las partículas del cadáver asesinado en continuidad material con la muerte? ¿O es el agua comúnmente desechada después de la preparación de los cuerpos para convertirlos en corpus delicti, ahora reciclada como materia del arte? Las preguntas, admito, son engañosas pues imponen una falsa dicotomía. Sin embargo, de los modos que respondamos a ellas depende nuestra interacción con la pieza y nuestra experiencia estética. Si la pieza funciona como escándalo, que irrumpe e interrumpe violentamente el placer estético, no es solo por la continuidad con el cadáver, sino por el hecho mismo de que lo que queda en la pieza es el resultado de una doble exclusión de los restos del cadáver a través del reciclaje del agua y del agua comúnmente desechada tras la limpieza del cuerpo muerto. 
estas reflexiones eh, estas reflexiones nacidas a la luz del análisis de la pieza de Margolles me invitan a regresar a mis lecturas anteriores de las otras dos piezas para cerrar esta charla eh, prestando atención sobre aquello que es expulsado en el mismo acto de creación cultural y su relocalización en los espacios del arte. Siguiendo esta línea, constataremos de inmediato ciertos paralelismos, pero también ciertas diferencias entre las piezas en el aire. También Vallecillo, como Margolles, limpia la materialidad para disponerlas en la pieza final. Las muelas no muestran ningún resto de sangre o carnosidad del individuo del que fueron extraídos. Son los innumerables dientes rotos los que importan. Matters that matter. Son ellos los que aparecen declarados en la cartela de la pieza. Son ellos los que están, establecen una contigüidad entre el doble significado de gusto del título y la necropolítica de la nación hondureña y la región de América Central. Contrario a lo que podría pensarse partiendo de la reacción del espectador, en un sentido material, no es la pieza de Margollas la más radical, sino la pieza de Burglet. Las bananas expuestas vienen directamente, como podemos ver, en las etiquetas que están en la instalación, en, eh, directamente del mercado mayorista y se convierten en residuos dentro del espacio del museo. En su estado de descomposición contaminan la atmósfera y otras pies. Es en ellas, creo, donde directamente se exhibe la relación compleja y ambivalente entre arte y decir. Fajariana, los motivos que nos has presentado realmente animan a, a crear una red de motivos, porque los motivos son muy insinuadores. O sea, yo de las muelas, tenemos una obra de arte con muelas de los Félix Mello, de, de no, no solo humanos, sino de tiburones, de, de nieves. O sea, y siempre es un poco, era un poco enigmático. ¿Por qué Félix, José Félix Mello usó las muelas, ¿no? los desechos? en su obra. Um, y después, claro, lo de las burbujas y esto. Yo escribí un artículo sobre arte latinoamericano con el título Bien o burbuja. Y claro, eso fue como el punto de partida, esta, estas burbujas de, de, de esa margolia que generalmente son muy... Uh, <risa> no, no, evidentemente son muy sí. impactantes. Sí. Hay, un, hay una relación directa con sí. el espectador. Eh, pero hay una relación en dos pasos. Primero es el placer estético de la burbuja, el reflejo, la debilidad, el movimiento incontrolable, y después es la especie de shock. Pero ¿no? además de la estetización, es la limpieza que me llamó la atención, o sea, que se limpia también uh, el recibo para, para exponerlo. Uh -huh. sí. que no pasó en todas las piezas pero ya, sabemos, dos, sí, sí, no, pero ya sí. sabemos que en inicios por ejemplo en una Bienal de Venecia donde presentaba eh, una, una performance que se repetía constantemente se limpiaba el piso con agua con sangre uh -huh. sangre real uh -huh. lo cual en términos legales fue una complicación y puso a la propia Bienal un poco a correr uh -huh. eh, precisamente como resolver esta cuestión eh, digamos eh, de ilegalidad uh -huh. y lo que sí es cierto es que una buena parte de la, de la producción de Teresa Margolles sí trabaja con los restos los restos directamente lo que pasa es que en el caso del agua es muy interesante porque ya no están los restos del, del, ser, del, 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 del ser humano asesinado, porque hay una insistencia en que de son asesinos. cadáveres de asesinato. Entonces ahí, sí, pues, creo que son uno de, de los aportes que puede, puede aportar el pensar las cosas más desde la, desde la cuestión del, del residuo, de la materia. Bueno, después, no sé si hay una pregunta. 
Porque y después del de contexto, ya, ya, ya. <risa> después del contexto que hemos dado Betty y yo, ahora inmersión directa al análisis uh, de tres piezas bajo un este denominador común de la basura. Uh, aplicada al arte con la crítica estético-política, ¿no? O sea, esto fue un poco... Y yo creo que con André <ríe> vamos a ir a un, un rumbo parecido, ¿no? Sí, tal cual. Sí, sí, sí. sí. Muchas gracias, Adriana. No, gracias a mí. Sí, vamos a marchar. Un poco. La... Sí, sí, sí. André de la Universidad de Zúrich también, pero enseña el portugués de la Universidad de San Galo, el portugués brasileño. ¿Hay comentarios a lo de Adriana? Sí, sí, sí. Sí, Elena, sí. Tanto, sí, a mí me ha... Me ha... Pues me ha dejado pensando lo que has dicho de que eh, crees que es más radical Bosle que Teresa en Margolles términos en términos materiales, sí. pero en términos de recepción, o sea, pensando en cómo se siente el espectador, creo que es... Muy claro, claro porque sí. tú llegas y ves los plátanos y los hueles y puedes decidir en ese momento entrar o no entrar a la sala, ¿verdad? Y puedes... Bueno, ver qué, qué haces, cómo, cómo te relacionas con esa, con esa obra, porque ya sabes a lo que te expones. Pero con Margolles eh, creo que lo, sí, no hay lo interesante sí. es que no lo sabes. Sí, sí, pero también, y esto es lo, lo interesante, es que en ese mismo impacto dejas de ver el hecho de que ese agua ya no tiene. Sí, hay una anécdota que se repite y una y otra vez, y es que Susan Sontag, eh, tras ver la instalación en una exposición en, en, en Nueva York, escribió en el libro de visitas Toque la muerte. Que es Susan Sonta, que además se ha dedicado a pensar la relación entre mirada y dolor, que ella misma lo ponga, es interesante. Pero es que en realidad no lo tocó. Porque ahí no está la muerte. Es decir, es una suerte de disparador, y ahí creo que es un punto clave, de disparador de una emoción particular, que es una emoción común, el dolor. El dolor, el duelo, el trauma, la ausencia, la nostalgia. Es decir, hay ahí un disparador que, de hecho, va mucho más allá del cadáver mismo. Y sin embargo, hay un espanto. Sí, y creo que en ese sentido una obra que a mí me parece que es también muy muy fuerte y muy radical de Margolles en esa Bienal de, de Venecia, son las tarjetas para picar cocaína, que la repartió en la inauguración. Entonces es precisamente para decirle a toda esa gente que estaba ahí, que se siente absolutamente fuera de la realidad violenta del mundo y de América Latina en particular, esto que tú vas a usar para divertirte en la fiesta que viene después, que sepas que tiene que ver con todo, toda esta exposición que estamos. ¿no? Entonces... Sí, es siempre como tocarte o, o dejar que toques, pero más bien llamar la atención. ¿no? Bueno, sí, no voy ahora sí. a entenderme, pero Bocle hace también, también en, su, en su producción general también hace cosas de ese tipo, pero con África. Caribe, África. Sí, 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 sí. Muy bien. Bien, entonces vamos a continuar ¿no? con esta discusión, porque va a ser una suerte de close reading de un artista brasileño llamado Rodrigo Braga, pero antes. Muchas gracias, Yvette, ¿no? por toda la valoración, por toda esta presentación a todos ustedes, vosotras y vosotros también, a Bobby también. Y bien, para no marchar con mucha digresión, voy a leer un poquito porque es lo mejor para mí, ¿vale? Bien, esta es una parte de, de mi investigación postdoctoral sobre lo que nombro como materialidades subterráneas, ¿no? que sería una discusión, un análisis de un par de artistas y producciones artísticas eh, latinoamericanas y especialmente eh, brasileñas. ¿no? Entonces voy a empezar. Eh, Rodrigo Braga es un artista brasileño cuya trayectoria está marcada por acciones performativas que dialogan directamente con el campo fotográfico y audiovisual. 
Muchas obras suyas señalan las tensiones relacionadas entre el ser humano y la naturaleza por medio de una inmersión corporal en la espacialidad verde. Las obras se basan mayormente en la experiencia del artista de compartir su presencia con el entorno y sobre todo con la materialidad forestal. Braga evoca un abanico de imágenes y acciones que desplazan al entendimiento común de la naturaleza y sus rasgos orgánicos, mientras el observador se confronta con nuevas organizaciones espaciales y visuales del ambiente verde. Ah, ¿Ahora? Ahora sí. Creo que sí. Vale. El artista siempre estuvo involucrado con una discusión sobre la relación entre el hombre, la naturaleza y la animalidad. Ahí tenemos ¿no? una copia de su sitio web. Este debate es recurrente no solo en sus obras, sino también en sus escritos incluidos en los catálogos de exposiciones individuales. Además, es interesante la manera como las creaciones del artista se acercan formalmente al debate sobre la crisis del antropoceno al hacer sus trabajos resonar visualmente las tensiones existentes en aquel contexto. La reorganización del espacio viviente, sus vídeos y fotografías, evidencia lo que Aito Krenak, ese pensador indígena brasileño, planteó como, cito, la marca más profunda del antropoceno, es decir, el nuestro arraigamiento a la idea fija del paisaje terrenal y de la humanidad. Fin de la cita. Un ejemplo es el video performance Mentira Repetida. Uh, Mentira Repetida de 2011, que es un video de más o menos 5 minutos y 20 segundos, y que tiene lugar en las islas pertenecientes al archipiélago fluvial de Anavillanas, ubicado en el interior de la Amazonía. La cámara se mantiene en un plano fijo y general, general captando en primer plano un árbol. En ese escenario verde surge el artista con el dorso desnudo y perfilado de la, de la cámara. A pesar de estar casi en el centro de la imagen, Braga se encuentra en el plano medio y entre dos árboles. Enseguida, el artista empieza a gritar repetidamente y lo más fuerte posible. El artista está tan físicamente comprometido con la repetición de la tarea a punto de su cuerpo perder la fuerza inicial. La respiración se fatiga cada vez más, al igual que la voz, que comienza a fallar y volverse ronca. El agotamiento elimina cualquier imagen de centralidad del cuerpo del, arti del artista frente a la cámara ya que comienza a desaparecer a lo largo del vídeo, mientras el cuerpo exhausto se hunde con la foresta. El grito exhaustivamente repetido conduce, por tanto, al fracaso del cuerpo. En el ámbito de la recepción, el sonido repetido del grito expande la experiencia sinestésica del observador al llevarlo más allá de la visualidad áptica, al mismo tiempo que la materialidad del vídeo performance con sus texturas y de luz es el punto de recuperación de la atención del observador al campo visible. Un acercamiento crítico posible al video performance es ofrecido por el artista mismo en uno de los textos publicados en el catálogo de, de la exposición individual que tuvo lugar en São Paulo en 2012. El escrito es una suerte de enunciado a través del cual Praga expresa ciertas opiniones relativas a supuestas particularidades de la voz humana ante otros seres vivientes. El texto está intercalado con 32 notas a pie de página que aparentemente aclaran y desarrollan las, las diversas negativas señaladas en el texto y que ahora lo cito. Bien, es una traducción así más o menos porque tiene una suerte de repetición ahí, ¿no? El ser no croa, no arrulla, no gorjea, no llora, no croa, no glutea, no buje, no trina, no cloquea, no grazna, no habla, no ruge, no lula, no le rincha, no gruñe, no ronca, no silba, no zumba, no resona, no bala, no maula, no late, no ladra, no rime, no aula, no chilla, no arbuzna, no ruge, no berra, no brama, no gruñe. El ser grita. Es solo esto y nada más porque solo gritar es una acción del inconsciente y una mentira, mentira repetida. Fin de la cita. 
Ser algo que grita, portanto, é sugerido como sinônimo de lo humano. E o grito é considerado um ato de inconsciência e que, todavia, se mantém sendo uma mentira continuamente representada. No texto de Medanchio, cujo, cujo título, eh, título perdão, referência diretamente ao escrito homônimo de San Agustín, Rodrigo Braga sostiene que, cito, a mentira gritada repetidamente estabelece diferença, o que alude implicitamente ao debate de Lesiano para continuar com a afirmação de que, cito, esta repetição incessante, sem embargo, busca algo, busca algo visível desde o denso, algo sumamente complexo e oculto. Fim de la cita. Mais adelante, o artista se apropria da máxima cartesiana para reescrevê-la como grito, logo existo. Incluso subrayando que, cito uma vez mais, com cada grito, o mentiroso reitera que está mentindo. De hecho, o grito é apresentado como um elemento confirmatório da densa, complexa e oscura existência humana. Sem embargo, qual é a densa trama que se busca visibilizar através do grito repetido? Que mentira se grita repetidamente, mientras o acto mesmo de gritar demarca a existência humana? Quizás não seja, todavía possível contestar tales interrogantes de maneira categórica. Sin embargo, a afirmativa de que só o grito é uma ação do inconsciente e uma mentira repetida proporciona outra reflexão sobre o vídeo performance, posto que isto sugere a coexistência entre dois registros imagéticos, é dizer, um que é a materialização da noção do inconsciente e que tem o grito como o meio e produto de uma transmissão de experiências fora do controle da racionalidade, e outro em que a tarefa de gritar incansablemente parece ressonar um rechazo à repetição discursiva de, de, de dichas verdades. Aqui, o artista parece reproduzir um passagem do Manifesto Antropófago de Oswaldo de Andrade e que revela como este autor modernista brasileiro se posiciona, cito, contra a verdade dos povos missioneiros e que seria, segundo Andrade, uma sorte de, cito, mentira muitas vezes repetida. A referência implícita ao conhecimento antropofágico parece comprovar-se por a quantidade de notas a pé de página contenidas no passagem anteriormente citado, ou seja, o número de 32 que é semelhante à quantidade de dientes da espécie humana adulta. Por certo, o ser humano está constituído por a capacidade de apropriar-se de algo repetidamente, de produzir constantemente linguagem, incluso mentira e violência. Sem embargo, o que o vídeo performance de Praga evoca através do grito repetido bajo a aventura linguística da mentira é o outro polo da capacidade humana de produzir excesso, é dizer, o intento vazio, pelo deseado de descargar-se da fantasia de plenitude, assumindo assim a violência produzida por seus atos. Bajo essa perspectiva, o grito não é mero um sonido sem sentido produzido por um ser vivo, se trata de uma materialidade sonora particular da espécie humana e que, portanto, lo distingue de los demás vivientes, aunque esto no le dê o direito de assumir uma posição de supremacia. Em realidade, o grito produz um alejamento do humano de sua verticalidade ao poner o corpo em la posição horizontal e cerca do suelo. Isso ocorre em mentira repetida, em vídeo performance, quando o corpo erecto de Rodrigo cede ante o cansaço que lhe provoca o grito. O agotamento corporal é intenso até o ponto de levar o pouco a pouco ao suelo e praticamente sacá-lo das lentes da câmara em los últimos minutos do grito. O corpo que grita regressa à terra, desciende do campo de la, de la racionalidade ao ver-se comprometido pelo esforço de gritar. O grito se apresenta como uma forma de comunicação agramática, sem sema, sem significado generativo. Por outro lado, isso não significa que o grito não se trata de um linguagem e tampouco de mera descarga motora. Estas múltiplas camadas e, perdão, capas de leitura possíveis que se desplegam de mentira repetida nos permitem considerar o grito, por um lado, como elemento agramático que o linguagem usureiro de outro sendo regola as margens e optou por não escutá-lo, e por outro, como a expressão vocal de la revuelta de los desamparados ante a la violência econômica e ecológica provocada por políticas extrativistas. Bajo a proposta de relação entre o resto vocal e a crise do antropoceno, 
podemos plantear que el grito en mentira repetida es sobre todo la materia reveladora de la histórica y falsa fantasmagoría de las estrategias, estrategias visuales que buscaban controlar la espacialidad forestal bajo la construcción del pasaje, de la idea del pasaje. ¿no? Otro punto que considero importante de reflexionar es sobre el predominio de la espacialidad forestal y mentira repetida. Especialmente cuando Braga, agotado por la tarea de gritar, entrega el cuerpo al suelo. El acto de gritar borra el aparente, el, perdón, el aparente protagonismo del artista que se traslada a la materialidad florestal. La falta de dramatismo en la captura de la imagen, marcada por la inmovilidad de un plano general, nos lleva al desafío de la reconstrucción simbólica del vasto legado de representaciones de, del espacio abierto. Mentira repetida propone la desviación del vasto arsenal cultural de figuraciones de la foresta con una espacialidad idílica y receptáculo de imágenes de un entorno original y a menudo paradisíaco. Figuraciones estas que deshacen las tensiones presentes en las relaciones entre la especie humana y la vida forestal. En la obra de Braga se nota un deseo de encontrar otras narrativas para la materialidad forestal, o sea, contra narrativas visuales sin las capas de lectura que se le han colocado a lo largo de la historia visual del occidente. En el video performance hay una captura visual de la foresta que se separa del grandioso registro de imágenes que crea una espacialidad intimidad global con el entorno de la mata tropical, especialmente a través de las imágenes de la Amazonía que circulan internacionalmente. Esto sería interesante, por ejemplo, comparar la obra de Braga, por ejemplo, con las representaciones fotográficas de Sebastián Salgado sobre la Amazonía, ¿no? Entonces, mentira repetida se produce como una suerte de contranarrativa que se pone a representaciones visuales de carácter monumental. O sea, es un arte o una obra de arte que no hace pacto con dicha, esto es eh, una expresión de Praga, hipertrofia de lo imaginario que se cae sobre la foresta amazónica. Mentira repetida llama la atención crítica a la tensión histórica entre nat naturaleza y cultura que, está, que se establece impregna la mirada humana sobre el espacio forestal. Una tensión que, en cierto modo, sigue siendo análogo a la urgencia de problematizar la visión antropocénica del mundo que subestima la capacidad de las vidas no humanas para resistir a la acción del hombre. De Miembros de espacio aquí. Um, bien, la ético-política de las elecciones visuales de Braga no ignora la capacidad de afecto estético que las imágenes pueden ofrecer. La mentira repetida invierte en una materialidad visual, aunque carente de supremacía, cuando se pone en coexistencia con registros como el sonido, en el caso el grito, proporcionando nuevos enfoques perceptivos. Si, como planteamos anteriormente, el video performance desmantela construcciones visuales históricamente establecidas que representan la foresta, no sería tal acto a favor de cancelar la visión, sino de desplazar su posición protagónica en una cultura occidental profundamente sedimentada en la visualidad. El artista no se aparta de la estética visual, sino que simplemente propone un acercamiento a ella, combinándola con el acto ético de sacar de la, de la anestesia la mirada del observador, para permitir y generar una reflexión crítica afectada, en el sentido espinosa del lesiono de los afectos. ¿no? Y podemos decir, por ejemplo, que en cierto sentido la producción de Braga ¿no? se contrapone a una suerte de producciones y que llegaron, llevaron ¿no? al crítico eh, Thomas D. Jemos a decir esto, ¿no? Against the extractivist logic of the capitalist scene, a world sacrifice on the earth itself to interests of short-term profits, artists and activists, as well as communities, send to do it politi politics differently, a restoring and inventing alternative forms of life and creative modes of ethical being in common. They are drawing on existing wisdoms and proposing no new logics, remaking the world as know it in imagination, representation, and practice. 
tomando em consideração a última parte do argumento de Demos, que está aí não? com grifos míos, e digamos se a, obra de, se a obra de Braga está realmente comprometida com a remodelação do mundo, ou, mais bem, com o acto de depressá-lo a partir do que se quer, ou do que se há quedado. Rodrigo Braga não reace o mundo segundo, segundo nossa imaginação, sino que tenta evocar de maneira performativa e urgente uma etapa prévia, o duelo por pérdidas irreversíveis. Não se trata de reconstruir o mundo a partir de arte, sino de enfatizar o reconhecimento das pérdidas e das huelas que se quedam, ruínas, restos, sobras. Esta perspectiva nos permite abordar o comentário de Aito Krenat, com o qual eh, me gostaria não, finalizar minha charla. Não há fim do mundo mais iminente que quando se tem um mundo ao outro lado do muro e um outro a este lado, e ambos tratando de adivinar quem está sendo louco. Este é um abismo, esta é uma caída. Então, a pergunta que habría que fazer seria por que temos tanto medo na caída se em outras épocas não temos feito nada mais que cair? E, segundo Krenak, não se trata de desviar-se do leito da caída, sino assumir la mediante a fabricação de paracaídas de colores. Esta é uma expressão de Krenak. Buscando, assim, outras formas de afrontar os efeitos irreparáveis do antropoceno. Lo que queda é fazer ou reacer lo possível ou impossível, impossível com o que resta. Sin embargo, o desafio é também epistemológico, pois implica empreender leituras e representações do antropoceno mais allá da narrativa do fim apocalíptico e da moral redentora, que prevalece em várias representações contemporâneas sobre o fim do mundo, no arte contemporâneo. Porque o mundo já teve vários finales e demonstrou, todavía sua capacidade de continuar com ou sem a espécie humana. Ademais, o arte latino-americano contemporâneo, implicado com o debate sobre o espaço te, eh, forestal ou terrenal, vem ressaltando que as formas de vida não humanas não necessitam de lombre, é dizer, esta figura occidental, blanca e com base ilustrada, para autorregular-se ante as inexoráveis e irreversíveis catástrofes atuais e futuras generadas em e por o antropoceno. Finalmente, tales produções señalam a necessidade de uma relação coletiva entre os diferentes seres vivos, em outras palavras, os diferentes nós que compartem o espaço da Terra. Bem. Mais inversão, mais uh, uh, concentração, close reading, em um motivo, o del grito a região amazônica, o antropoceno e a crítica extractivista, a mim me parece muito interessante o motivo do grito, não só posto a lo visual, salgado, etc., sino a os gritos em os bibliotecólogos. Ou seja, eu acho que não se ha trabalhado até agora, e eu acho que isso é sumamente interessante. Ou seja, o motivo do grito é os bibliotecólogos, porque ele é um exemplo impressionante, o sea, extremo, esto me, me llamó la atención. A ver si hay una pregunta, <risa> hay una pregunta, Adriana, del chat, sí. eh, ah, porque sí. fíjense que los de los de línea ya no superan a nosotros, ya van no, sí. no, Ah, bueno, entonces, bueno, sí. yo quería hacer una pregunta, pero... Bueno, primero, primero, rápida la pregunta, rápida la respuesta, sí, sí, sí. después eh, pregunta sí, es una Diana, y después se dice. Detalle, porque hasta ahora, esta última que no hubiera respondido a la pregunta, me interesaría saber si hace uso de la pantalla dividida. ¿La pantalla de? Dividida. No. Ah, isso é tudo. Esta, não, estas são somente frames do vídeo performance. Mas somente na pantalla, somente uma câmera fija e já. Em ele. Sim, era essa a pergunta, porque isso suscitaria uh -huh. outra, outra reflexão. Eu trago uma pergunta a ti, Adrián. Sim, esta pergunta que fiz no último momento, antes de cerrar a sessão passada. Pois, há uma pergunta e comentário de Isabel Pinheira em Dina. Não sei se, eh, Isabel, te gostaria de fazer a pergunta tu mesma ou eu leio? Bueno, o interessante de las burbujas de Margolles. A ver, a ver, outra vez. O interessante de las burbujas de Margolles é justamente a relação entre água e memória em en outras obras de arte. Me pergunto 
cómo lo piensas en estos términos, los de la memoria. Quizás de ahí derive su impacto. Bueno, eh, volvamos sobre mojado de alguna manera, porque es una de las cosas, digamos, uno de los puntos en los que se ha fijado precisamente la crítica. Es la relación entre un supuesto posconflicto, eh, ese posterior, que es una memoria en realidad muy cercana al presente, y eh, el considerar el arte como un dispositivo de memoria, como aquello que dispara el acto mismo de memoria. Eh, y evidentemente esto tiene que ver con una, la materialidad misma del motor de la memoria, de los, los que se vienen a llamar los archivos, anarchivos, contraarchivos, eh, en los que la obra de Teresa Margolles, sin duda alguna, es una figura súper importante. Eso iría por otra, por otra vía. Como dispositivo. Dispositivo material, en términos realmente de dispositivo. No de documento, pero de un dispositivo material. No sé si... No, muchas gracias. Ella dijo que la, eh, los bebés están llorando en el fondo, por eso no quería hacer eso. <risa> bueno, pero hay, hay más. De momento hay cuatro. ¿Qué preguntas? No, 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 no son preguntas. Solo, no, 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 él lo tiene, Omic lo tiene bajo control. Sí, sí, sí. No, a veces <risa> Sí, no te escucho. Los niños están llorando. Bueno, muchas gracias, Andrés. Gracias, muchas gracias. gracias. Y ahora, la última de la pausa, Elisi, historiadora del arte, eh, profesora asistente de la Universidad de Berlín. Bienvenida. Y ahora, desde esta inmersión en piezas similares de arte que agradecemos mucho de Adriana y André, eh, vamos a volver al panorama más amplio, más general. Eh, de, de, sí. Además voy a hablar en inglés, entonces... Sí, bien, bien. Vamos a cambiar. Bien. Um, so, uh, yes. <laughs> Well, as it's loading, I will uh, first take a chance to say thank you to uh, Edith Sanchez for the invitation to participate. I'm um, uh, really happy to sort of be here today, given that I'm relatively new to Switzerland. So this gives me a really good opportunity to meet other stakeholders, uh, uh, or the primary stakeholders, really, here in Switzerland that are working um, on and invested in sort of Latin American art. Um, so. As, as I mentioned, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so um, as I mentioned, I'm relatively new here to uh, Switzerland, um, and I thought this would be an opportunity to kind of introduce myself and introduce my work um, um, to, to all of you, um, and also to give you a bit of a sense of kind of what I'm doing here and what I want to do here, um, <laughs> now that I'm in Switzerland. So, um, and so I, I just wanted to kind of at least introduce myself, um, as you might have read from my bibliography, that I'm a newly appointed assistant professor at the Institute for Art History at the University of Bern, where I hold a position as the world art historian in the department and also am directing the Global Studies do doctoral program in the world. So um, essentially this means that my research and my teaching on Latin American art is primarily situated within a world or global framework and, um, and also really tends to privilege relational paradigms. And um, I think this is uh, very reflective of kind of what my work does. Um, and so I thought that, you know, I would formulate a presentation that kind of elaborates on my research up until this point, which tends to dovetail with my current position in world art history as a way to kind of open up a discussion on the concept of Latin American art, its categories, and its increasingly larger frame um, within the global contemporary. And, um, you know, which I would say within the context of art tends to um, reduce nationalisms and regionalisms um, and leans towards a more neutral artistic language. So, you know, as, as we're talking about Latin American art, um, 
both as it's situated within the sort of geographic borders of what Latin American art, Latin America uh, is considered to be, and also then what is it, um, and how do we consider um, artistic practices, artists as being Latin American once they're situated outside of those contexts and those borders. So um, I also wanted to kind of say as a part from my research, I'm deeply invested in sort of connecting art histories um, by bridging Latin American art to international contexts through teaching and pedagogy, which I hope to kind of um, develop here while I'm in Switzerland. Um, so I'll kind of proceed with a cursory overview of my research and sort of end on the topic of what I see as potentially possible with uh, Switzerland. Um, so first I just kind of wanted to um, talk about the way I kind of started to probe these transnational connections um, through my uh, doctoral dissertation, which later took shape as this book that you see here, Dematerialization and the Social Materiality of Art, which came out in 2021. And, um, you know, the kinds of transnational connections in which it was looking at was primarily um, Argentina um, in relationship to Europe and the United States. And this kind of continues to be sort of the, the connections that I tend to draw. However, um, you know, I, I I, I feel as if I'm sort of heading towards more south to south connections a little bit, but um, as I am situated here in Europe, I still feel as if it, it's it's incredibly relevant to um, to look at the continued uh, connections between sort of Latin America and, and Europe, um, as well as the United States, which is where I'm originally from. Um, so um, this book, as you kind of get a sense from the description is really, um, an attempt to kind of draw, uh, create this conversation within a strand of art historical scholarship interested in addressing how the concept of dematerialization was conceived by artists and critics. And it is um, also concerned with Argentina's artistic avant-garde in the 1950s and 60s, which I argue materially responded to an ideology of dematerialization of art prompted by and in dialogue with particular historical conditions of modernization. This study therefore inscribes non-object-based artistic forms known as happenings, arte vivo, pop art, and arte de los medios, um, which you see here within broader and yet specific shifts in the development of modernism in Argentina, yet in dialogue with Europe and the United States. Um, so here I'm showing um, one example that also is, is uh, a focus in the book, which is this, um, creation of happenings um, that was organized by Oscar Masota, who was an Argentine philosopher and critic, um, uh, who coined this term dematerialization, despite the fact that it has been sort of um, largely been associated with um, conceptual art uh, and the development of conceptual art within the US and American context um, in the 1960s. And, um, you know, I should say that um, you know, for me, I wasn't necessarily concerned with the genesis of dematerialization as a concept in the 1960s, nor was I preoccupied with whether Argentine, the Argentine philosopher and critic Oscar Masota or the U.S. curator Lucy Lepard coined the term first, um, or to the extent to which Masota influenced Lepard's thinking, which has also been very much part of the conversation of you know, who influenced who and who was first and all these sorts of things. But I think um, where I kind of ascribe my position is that it aligns more closely with Andrea Junta and George Flattery's method of synchronicity, which, a quote, draws attention to simultaneity and paral parallelisms, regardless of whether there are veritable historical links or not. Um, and part of the book is, is trying to draw those links, but I think this this concept of, uh, or method of synchronicity is something that continues throughout my work in terms of trying to at least address the ways in which certain kinds of discourses and practices emerged at the same time that weren't necessarily collect, um, uh, directly connected, but perhaps were parallel or um, influenced in more indirect ways. Um, and I want to sort of say that this mode of analysis of synchronicity repositions Latin American art on a simultaneous plane with international artistic developments. And so my aim is to give attention to a particular formulation 
of dematerialized practices that are local to and contextualized in Argentina, yet entangled with the international art world, redrawing modernism's spatial and temporal configuration. Um, and so in this example, what's kind of blurry about it is the fact that Oscar Matsota creates this cycle of happenings, happenings also being a very sort of uh, Euro-American kind of uh, term and kind of form. Um, and what he's doing is he's quoting and, citate and citing these um, American artworks that he saw when he was there in New York, for example, or he saw through reproductions that were coming to Argentina and Buenos Aires. And so he creates this sort of cycle of, of works that he calls um, uh, Sobre Happenings, and they kind of re-perform these works. And I'm looking at the various ways in which kind of citation and reproduction is kind of happening, and the way in which these artists, um, and Masoda in particular, is, is trying to sort of be in dialogue with, with this kind of uh, work, with these kinds of discourses, um, but also very much sort of reinterpret them and also give them a new kind of context, context and meaning once they are reperformed in, say, uh, Buenos Aires. And this this happened at the, the famous Tita La. Um, another example that comes out of the book is uh, the work of Marta Menohin um, and uh, her cajas, um, as well as her environmental installations. Um, and so here I have um, two examples of her work. One is the cajas, and then the other one is the you now famous La Menesunda from 1965. And um, what I do is I, I try to kind of talk about the way in which her particular sojourn in Paris, because she um, she traveled there in order to study, and then she lived there for um, a number of years, as well as in New York, and how um, her experience not only in um, Paris at this particular moment had a certain kind of influence on her work and reshaped it in very particular ways, and the way in which she started to think about sort of um, the urban environment and the way she tried to kind of translate that into her work. And so the Cajas really kind of um, looks at the relationship between her sort of assemblages, her also work of kind of discarded materials as we're talking about discarded materials um, and its emergence kind of in Paris and sort of how then she is sort of thinking about that, but then really begins to kind of turn towards um, the kind of shifting environment uh, that is produced by modernization in Buenos Aires and really uses this kind of material and the kind of discourse around it and kind of conceptualization around it to sort of talk about um, the changing material environment in say Buenos Aires. And so you have that very specifically operating in the work La Menesunda. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, essentially, I'm kind of looking at Minopin's sort of uh, type of experimentation with uh, assemblage as it developed and expanded into environmental uh, forms um, and how she put them in relationship to the city of Buenos Aires. Um, and I think, you know, the, the type of material and the sort of assemblage, well, we can also categorize it as a kind of dematerialized art form in the sense that it was trying to... Um, um, get away from uh, uh, these kind of more permanent art forms, ones that are more object-based, but becoming more and more sort of disintegrated in a particular way. Um, we're also trying to sort of make this more a concrete reality of a new and accelerating modernity. Um, so I'm, I, I'm really just going to very quickly now shift to um, my current project, which is um, also very much about looking at connections um, between sort of Latin America and um, Europe more specifically. Um, this particular project was um, started in 2019, in fact, um, because it was sort of the um, proposal that I had put together for the Mary Curie Fellowship, which I had uh, was awarded and um, had the chance to do at the University of Amsterdam. Um, and this book obviously, can, or I mean, this project continues as I'm now trying to sort of shape it into uh, a book 
tentatively titled On the Margins, Alternative Art, Transnational Networks, and Latin American Artistic Diasporas. And so here I'm showing you the work of Ulysses Carrion, um, who was working with his partner, Art Van Barneveld and Salvador Torres. Um, and Ulysses Carrion is an example of um, an artist who is originally from Mexico, but left um, to study in Europe. He first landed in Paris, but then he ended up, um, yeah, he first landed in Paris, studied in the UK, and then ended up <coughs> permanently settling in Amsterdam uh, in the Netherlands. And um, it's really interesting uh, how he is part of a larger group of Latin American artists that settled in Amsterdam, which hasn't really received a lot of attention. I think Carrion is one artist that has had um, significant reception, but um, those within his kind of orbit that are also from Latin America, such as Colombia, um, Brazil, are kind of in the background in a way. But what is really interesting is kind of how they um, all came together to kind of develop a certain experimental artistic practice, but also they were all primarily uh, gay. And so in fact, the reasons for them leaving Latin America was not necessarily associated with dictatorial violence, which is often how um, artists that left Latin America, say in the 60s, are often attributed for leaving for these reasons. But in fact, Ulysses Carrion, um, Michel Cardena, Flavio Pons, and Claudio Goulart in particular, I think had a very different kind of trajectory and a different motivation for leaving Latin America. That they, they were experiencing a, another form of oppression and another form of kind of uh, violence that was largely directed towards their sexuality. And once they left Latin America and were situated in Europe, they were actually able to talk about the, their own subjectivities through their work in a way that they probably couldn't have done in Latin America. Um, and so I think this is one facet that's really interesting to me. And the other facet I think is the way in which their artistic practices, um, it was through their artwork that they then facilitated a larger network within Europe that connected them to other artists, other Latin American artists specifically within Europe. So um, here I'm talking about Horacio um, Zavala in Italy. Um, we have uh, Guillermo Diesler in the GDR. Um, and so you have these artists that are in different um, parts of Europe, largely outside of the center, so outside of Paris, um, that, are, uh, that have left Latin America for different reasons, um, but then are kind of facilitating this connection and dialogue through their, practice, their experimental art practices, which largely include performance, um, mail or postal art, um, publications, um, artist books, um, and also uh, certain kinds of um, uh, editorial um, projects. And so this that I'm show here, what I'm showing um, is ephemera, which was um, an actual very short lived publication that occurred um, just for a couple of years, but largely um, collected and assembled a lot of postal artworks um, and then republished them, recirculated them, not only within Europe, but within um, Latin America and, and more internationally than, than that, in fact. Um, but they had this particular sort of motivation to stay connected to Latin America, which you see, for example, in the issue that I'm showing to uh, your right, which is um, the ephemera that was dedicated to Brazil, for example. And so you see a number of examples in the way that these artists use their artwork to kind of facilitate a certain kind of dialogue to advocate for artists that were um, under particular, still living under um, repressive regimes and um, uh, situations uh, in Latin America. So I think this is um, another way of trying to kind of establish what I call a kind of Latin American diaspora um, that existed in Europe. Um, and that was connected through through their art practice. Um, so let's see here. Um, 
So yeah, what I what I wanted to kind of share was that histories of art have largely pointed to the various dictatorial regimes, which I mentioned in Latin America, that led to many artists to flee violent and oppressive political cir circumstances, um, which is true for all of them. At the same time, narratives of art artists or artistic mobility have focused on the flows from Latin America to New York, who's growing. Uh, influence in the post-war period eclipsed Paris's position as the art world center of power. And this is really um, demonstrated in the exhibition that happened at Isla in New York um, that was per, um, put together by, um, or no, it was Isla and the America Society um, exhibition that really looked at the concentration of Latin American artists that were in the New York art scene and the kind of what they were doing. Um, so I'm trying to kind of at least give some attention to uh, this other network that was on, on the side of the globe. So despite the overwhelming interest in New York, a significant group of artists migrated to Europe, establishing themselves in peripheral cities, uh, peripheral in relationship to Paris. Um, and um, despite their dispersed and decentralized locations, these artists developed a relational network of experimental and marginal art. And so what I'm trying to do is also kind of um, develop this concept around marginal, which they used um, in a way that I think not only addresses kind of the marginal or alternative art practices that they were developing, um, meaning that they were marginal to kind of the mainstream art institutions or the mainstream kind of artistic trends, but also how they were thinking about marginality um, in relationship to their own subjectivities, in relationship to their own place in Europe, for example, and how this kind of extends and um, beyond just kind of the artwork itself. Um, so on the margins is a transnational history that maps this network with particular attention to their formation of a diasporic community of Latin American artists oops, um, within Europe and an alternative art world outside of hegemonic centers through their art practices. Um, the book will focus on the work of Ulysses Carrion, as I mentioned, Miguel Angel Cárdenas, who changed his name for a brief moment to Michel um, Cárdenas, uh, Felipe Ehrenberg, Cecilia Vicuña, um, and I think I have a slide, yeah, that looks at some of the other artworks that I'm addressing um, or projects. Horacio Zavala, Guillermo Wiesler, and artists within their orbit from the late 1960s and the late 1980s. Um, and it tries to trace the dynamic artistic panorama, pan, panorama that engaged experimental art practices, such as artist books, as I mentioned, male art, video, as well, perform and performance. Um, which were also very much in close dialogue with fluxes and conceptual art practices um, developing with, within Europe, but tries to do something very different. Um, so I, I present extended interpretations of the artwork, uh, artworks of these artists as modalities which examine their transnational subjectivities, developed transcultural production, and formed alternative networks, uh, networked worlds of art. Um, Furthermore, it tries to draw the potential relationship between alternative art and the politics of marginality across the transnational access between Europe and Latin America. Um, and I also would say that I, I, would, uh, I would consider a task of the study is to recover these artists' artworks' critical impact on both local and international art scenes, um, and that due to their transnational identities and experimental work, Many of these artists have been overlooked within national histories of art and have larger implications for the history of art. And I think this goes back to still how art history is structured um, and the fact that we, at least within the discipline, still very much use these sort of geographic and national kind of categories in which to um, write certain histories, although that is changing. Um, so, you know, I, I would like to believe that the, this project kind of challenges at least national frameworks, regional identifications such as Latin America, um, and certain spatial bifurcations such as like center and periphery, because these artists were really kind of at the, at the crux of, of both of these uh, places. So, um, so in terms of how that translate, not only in kind of my research and and um, these publications, but I've also been 
um, heavily involved in trying to kind of generate more conversations and put more scholars that are also invested in this kind of um, work together. So there was a conference that just happened um, this year, um, which, you know, I would say in addition to kind of bringing scholars together on this particular subject, it also was very much about facilitating certain encounters and collaborations with institutions in Latin America. So in this case, we had the opportunity to work with MASPI. Um, I mean, sorry, yes, the, the sorry, the Museum of Contemporary Art in uh, Sao Paulo. Um, so to kind of end and to give you a sense of where I'm going, though, as you can see with the last project, is largely a male dominated uh, art network, um, which, um, you know, I taken a lot of pains to try to uh, draw out some of the women protagonists uh, in that male art network, um, but I would still say it's largely male dominated. And so I've started to kind of turn towards also um, certain kinds of um, feminist uh, and, and more female focused, I would say, uh, histories of art. So the kind of work that I'm trying to now look at is um, for example, the work of Alicia Barney, who um, in 1975 created this um, work called Puente Sobre la Tierra, where um, she is not only trying to kind of uh, work within sort of the terms of landscape or alternative landscape, but also very much thinking about land art. Um, and I use this term carefully, but it is one that she absolutely subscribed to. And so again, um, and I'm, I'm trying to sort of draw out these certain synchronicities through her work, um, because what is what ends up happening is that she um, she did her master's, her MFA in uh, in um, in on the East Coast in in the U.S. And I'm just for whatever reason the name is escaping me for the moment about where she did it. Um, but anyway, what she does is she's exposed to kind of all these different sort of exhibitions that are thinking about ecologic art, land art, and um, and what she does is that when she goes back to um, Colombia after finishing her MFA, she starts to produce a number of different practices that are then read in Colombia as a kind of alternative landscape. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of looking at the way in which she sort of reconceives landscape um, from this particular location in Colombia and the way in which she then expands out to it to then have a much more eco-critical perspective that really shapes her work, that really defines her as a very different kind of artist than the Latin artists um, that you see sort of in the US or uh, in Europe, for example, or any of these names that you see here. Um, and so this is, I'll just end on this uh, artwork, which is uh, her uh, Diario Objecto, um, which was a series of works in which she um, called um, not only trash um, from say the streets of New York when she was um, on the East Coast, but also then when she's in Colombia, she's actually um, not necessarily pulling trash, but actually collecting these much more sort of organic materials and creating these kinds of assemblages um, with them. So yeah, I think I'll end there. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing your two projects, uh, providing us with a his art historic uh, historians uh, view about all the 60s. Uh, I think this relational network is also growing here in, in the room because I saw already several connections with Adriana, the ephemer materials, mm -hmm. or the ecological art, trash, and also land art with Andre, and also with the Latin American, in general, artistic diaspora with our Rodrigo. So, I mean, here in here on the meta level, it's also uh, growing, but it was interesting to see this, this perspective of the 60s, because it's not so well known, you know, to general people as myself, for instance. I was wondering, for instance, how this Marta Minujin was, how was the reception in her time? Is it also an artist, which is now so general, to be rediscovered today? Or was she important in the 60s too, with her happenings?
Yeah, I think she was definitely one of the artists that received. Uh, yeah, that that was actually kind of at the forefront, but also received an incredible amount of attention. But I think that was also because of the way in which she um, really instrumentalized kind of her her character and also her or, or the kind of rise of media and communication and really use that in her favor. Um, so, but I think also the fact that she among the other artists that she was very much working with and collaborating with um, were also very much attached to Ditella, which I think was you know an experimental art play, uh, art institute, but at the same time incredibly uh, prolific in its programming. So I do feel as if um, you know he did did have a, a very almost canonical presence already at that point, and it's only now that she's really become entrenched in the canon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the normal thing. And this also, I mean, you know, rediscovering female artists uh, connects you with Betty Sanchez too. So, uh, but it's interesting to have this historic, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I would definitely um, say that um, giving the attention to kind of female artists is uh, still very much needed in the Specifically, when we're talking about this period, this period between say, the sixties and the eighties, um, there there's a lot of work that has been done. And I mean, surely the exhibition, the Radical Women exhibition, really did a lot to highlight some of the women artists. Um, but I still feel as if yeah, there's a lot of kind of more art historical scholarship that could um, go in into that work much deeper. So. Some question. Public or is there any no, other question? Oh, yeah, there's a question. What so, is uh, <laughs> thanks to Isabel again. She's very active. <laughs> uh, you want to ask your question on your own, or you want me to read it again if the kids are not crying? Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> <Out loud. laughs> so, having a background art theories and arts uh, on differentiation, I'm particularly interested in the balance between uh, materiality. <laughs> The materiality you propose in relationship with global alternative networks and migration flows. So, um, globality at the time mean uh, material support, but in the last decade, the alternative art scene became a lot neutral. What's your view on the change of the cultural field, or maybe just in relation to your current research and time? Um. Yeah, so I guess I would say, yeah, if we're trying to think of maybe the more analog practices that perhaps I'm looking at and those that emerge now, which are kind of on the alternative um, end of the spectrum, um, it's true that those practices are, are much more sort of virtual and they're obviously utilizing a different kind of uh, mechanism to create these kinds of networks and everything like that. But um, yeah, I, I I would say that I agree with a number of art historians that want to look at, say, the 60s as this kind of analog version of that. Um, and I think what it does is it does draw a different kind of definition of internationalism, because obviously, you know, globality and the, the global wasn't necessarily a concept that is... Um, that emerged in the 60s, so it was much more international internationalism. And often that def that meant that you were just working, if you were an artist in the US with an artist in Europe or vice versa. And so what these artists do is really try to kind of extend beyond this very narrow transnational flow and begin to create these um, broader networks with Eastern Europe and um, Latin America, as well as certain parts of Asia. And so I think this is, um, this is also is what is very interesting to me is how they start to redefine what it is to be international as well. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> But we need a break because we're such a network, and this is why we need that break. And we have food.
out there because you see the carpet of our Japanese architect is not very practical to eat. So we have to get food on the terrace and then eat wherever you wish, outside or here. It's salty and sweet and we have uh, the drinks there. Exactly. So you've got water here, coffee, you can grab your coffee or even if you wish fruit and then the dress is ready. This fresh earth. <laughs> See, I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you very thank much. You. So, welcome back from the break. Uh, after we heard a lot about, uh, well, a lot of great contributions about the topic. Um, we're now delving a little bit more into the, the practical side of all of it, uh, where, where our theory meets uh, reality. Uh, and there's an important subtitle to my presentation that is actually not in the, in the program, which of course that um, uh, this uh, uh, presentation is all about from the gallery perspective. Uh, so <laughs> I'm here. Um, instead of Peter Kilchman, the gallerist. You will not <laughs> Representing Peter Yeah, Kilchman. that's it. <laughs> Peter uh, is very busy. He is in Paris this week, where there's a lot of activities. Uh, there's exhibition openings, our own exhibition openings. So um, Yvette uh, suggested I join today. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I will talk about uh, my role as an artist leads on in in a commercial gallery, and what kind of uh, obligations, tasks, um, and um, uh, sensible uh, considerations I <laughs> consider in my daily practice. Um, first, though, we talk about uh, briefly about the gallery. Um, so. Uh, Peter started his gallery in 1992, uh, and we currently have gallery spaces in Zurich and Paris. Um, that's Peter here. That's the official gallery portrait. Uh, that's Peter um, pretty much now. We said, well, we celebrated 30 years last year, and that's uh, on the right. That's a portrait of him in the early 90s. Um, and he, of course, is the person who put together the gallery program and built up all these connections with Latin American artists. Uh, from the 40 artists uh, plus minus that we have in uh, our program, a quarter to a third, depending on how you look at it, um, is uh, Latin American artists. And um, Peter uh, in, in the late 90s went to his, uh, well, he's not, he's not Latin American, he's uh, Swiss. And in the late 90s, um, out of curiosity and uh, as a means to diversify his portfolio, uh, he went to Mexico City, to the Mexico City Art Fair, and uh, there made his first connections with Latin American artists. Uh, and uh, I will just briefly go through the ones that we have in our portfolio. It would be not, there's not enough, enough time to talk about all of them. Uh, so actually the first one that he met, well, actually, no, let's, let's first talk, I'll show you real quick where we are uh, situated. This is at uh, right next to Prime Tower in Zurich, our main gallery at Sonnrotstrasse. Uh, we're in the, um, we're in the third floor. Um, then last, well, no, actually more than two years ago, uh, Peter opened at Remy Strasse in Zurich, a second branch in Zurich, which a lot of other galleries did at the time as well. Uh, this is our space there. And then last fall, October of 2022, um, we opened a space in Paris uh, and we've had a number of exhibitions there already. Uh, one of them was, for instance, Dagoberto Rodriguez in the spring of this year. And in Mexico, back in the late 1990s, uh, this is, was one of the first artists that Peter met and connected with. Um, ironically, it's a Belgian, Mex it's a, it's a, he's a Belgian man, uh, but he uh, settled over to Mexico in the 1980s. This is Francis Alice, who is uh, a conceptional artist. Just have to move a little bit quickly through this. Uh, those are Los Carpinteros from Cuba, um, which, um, 
they started out in the 90s and um, collaborations amongst artists have, have been very popular at the time and still are in that area. And funny enough, during the pandemic, it became very popular in, in Europe for artists to build uh, collabs. Um, it's, if you have uh, limited means, then you often make sense to actually collaborate. It's very clever. Um, Fernanda Gomez, uh, Brazil born. Arte um, Bulgara, minimalist, modernist. Uh, Beatriz Gonzalez, uh, she is already in her 90s. Um, from Colombia, um, and by the way, I only indicated the country where they're from because a lot of them actually, and we, we touched on this um, um, uh, this uh, nomadization, um, and well, a number of them have moved to other countries or live in other cities, or they live in two different countries at the same time. Um, Jorge Maki from Argentina, his topic is uh, the history of uh, psychoanalysis due to uh, the history of his parents. Uh, Teresa Morgoyes, which uh, Adriana already touched upon, and I'm uh, very glad and, uh, that you already introduced the group to uh, a very important work, and from 2003. I'll talk about her a bit more later. Uh, Joan Modé, a Brazilian modernist. Just recently had a solo show with him at our space at Tarnotstrasse. Um, and it's actually funny that uh, Teresa and uh, Mode are now it's in alphabetical order that they're uh, coming one after the, after the other because they their work couldn't be much much more different. Uh, Joao Mode is um, I'll we'll show you a picture later. His work is very playful, modernist, focused on geometric pattern, whereas of course Teresa is much more in the political and really kind of hits you like a, a brick hammer. Uh, Dagoberto, he, he's already, uh, we've already seen him as part of uh, Los Carpinteros. Javier Tellez, uh, who now lives in uh, New York. There's Seven Quinto, again, another artist collective uh, consisting of uh, Julio Castro, Gabriel uh, Rolando. Um, and then last but not least, uh, our latest addition to the program. And uh, this is Didier William. He is uh, US-based. He was born in Porto Prince, Haiti, 1983. And we, here we're kind of touching upon a topic that I think we've all kind of, or a number of us thought in the back of our heads. Well, um, is, it, is it appropriate to uh, just kind of like put a whole group of artists together and say, well, they're Latin American. So what about some, somebody from the Dominican Republic? Um, they're Caribbean or the Caribbean or they're Latin American, they speak Spanish. Uh, Didier doesn't speak Spanish, well, or not as his main language, he uh, speaks Creole. Uh, he will probably consider himself a Caribbean artist. I'm not sure how, I actually am not sure how he would feel if uh, that I included him on, on this list. He's the artist that I uh, work with uh, personally, that I, that I manage personally in the gallery. And um, so I just kind of took the liberty to include him here because I think his work is very uh, exciting and interesting and also to kind of like show okay well geographically we are close uh, also the topics are uh, there's there's an overlap uh, but again there are certain sensitivities that we have to consider uh, now so what there, there's kind of like a lot of well there, sometimes there's some prejudice as to what a gallery is and what it does and what it should do, what it shouldn't do. Um, so of course, um, primarily we work as agents of the artists. So we, first of all, we provide a space for them to present their work, uh, but we also have an agreement with them. So they, um, there, there's an agreement that we have that we can represent them. And of course, as a program gallery, um, a program gallery is not purely commercial, we actually, uh, look into the, the longer outlook of the artist's career. We uh, also want to ensure that um, the content or the message of the artist is um, presented appropriately. And we want to find um, other opportunities, be it in institutions globally um, or in private collections. There are some important ones that uh, for instance, uh, Betty um, has, us, has told us about uh, already so, uh, a bit. Um, or there are public collections that exhibit their work uh, well, in public. 
um, we want to create these opportunities for people who are interested, who have a passion uh, for um, or the curiosity for uh, these artists' works to to um, meet their work, to see it, to um, understand where they're coming from and uh, what it really is about and to actually make a personal connection. Um, now, my role as um, somebody who works directly with the artist is really to a large degree very practical. So um, a little bit about me, I'm, uh, I studied art history. I actually started out studying law in Zurich in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, mm. But um, I, a little bit like, again, like um, um, Betty, I realized very quickly, uh, well, that's actually not what I want to do. Um, and um, so I started working in an auction house. Uh, which is a little unusual because I um, pretty much did the reverse of what a lot of people in this field do. Um, actually didn't, didn't end up in an auction house as an expert. I actually went all the way back to working now with artists because an auction house uh, is really not popular with artists. So auction houses, it's the purely kind of, it's a place where it's purely commercial prices are investigated dem um, democratically. Uh, it's it's pretty much all about turnover. However, what uh, working in an auction house gave me was just an incredible overview and insight of what kind of artwork there is, what kind of um, uh, factors come into play in production, in logistics, in collectorship, in, well, expertise when you actually write the catalog about uh, the artist. Um, I had the opportunity with, a, with an athletic scholarship to go to the US um, after I decided to quit my law studies. Um, and uh, there I was in this funny situation that I was uh, I was in a rowing team and uh, my coach told me, well, you're probably the only rower in the entire United States that studies art history. And the art history students were always very put off by me, at least at the beginning when I walked in at 9 a.m. after my first workout uh, out on the lake and I came in with a with a, a, a sweater and um, pumped up and 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 um, yeah, well very much differently than they were. There was a lot of prejudice there as well. Um, however, after about a semester, um, we all realized, okay, well, then, uh, again, prejudice is usually is usually a bad thing. Um, and um, so after I shifted into the gallery work, I um, and due to kind of like an inherent curiosity that I had about uh, everything I really discovered that working working with the artist is something that really fulfills me and um, it is it is very complex it really kind of requires you to have a very broad understanding of all the factors that are involved in organizing an exhibition now the image you see here um, is um, again uh, it's, it's a recent case study that I wanted to introduce you to. This is a work, these are two works by Didier William uh, in front of a uh, uh, work by Vlasis Coniadis. And um, we'll actually go back and forth a little bit so you will see this exhibition here. It was one that we had this year about the topic of migration. Uh, it included 10 artists and it was not only Latin American artists. Um, and it was a concept that we um, developed uh, right before the summer break. And so I had to, when I wrote this concept, I had to kind of think about, okay, well, what are, what are kind of each of these artists' um, messages? What, are, what is their narrative? Um, and more importantly, how can I combine them in an exhibition that um, not only makes sense logistically and with the time frame and uh, a gallery it's a, it's a private it's it's a private business so we 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 don't get government funding we have to we have to consider all of these uh, um, factors and at the same time you want to make a, an exhibition that that's exciting that brings people in uh, even though we're in Zurich and we are one of the largest private exhibition spaces it's not easy for us to actually attract an audience um, so here this is actually a very good image so I asked. Didier, well, you know, he, he had just joined the gallery program. You know, we make this, this uh, exhibition about uh, the topic of migration and migration and your experience as a, as a, Haitian, as a young Haitian or your parents coming to the US 
in, in the 80s, uh, not, not being able to speak the language well, uh, it really is a big part of your work. And uh, do you, don't you want to contribute um, uh, works for the show? And of course, um, Didier was uh, on board right away because this is an important uh, topic for him. But at the same time, um, I had to be very careful or we, the gallery, had to be very careful that we presented his work in the right context. Migration is a very, very wide um, kind of field of what you can say. Um, and um, so we had to, uh, in our space, make sure that each of these artists is gets their own section, gets their own space, and that their um, work doesn't really collide with something that hangs adjacent to it or opposite to it. So for instance, um, Didier's work is very much about how to, how actually uh, overcoming this struggle of being a migrant uh, is empowering and that you do have agency in your faith. Whereas, for instance, um, Willie Doherty's work, he's from Northern Ireland, um, is about, if you look to the person on the right, how it's very ambiguous, how uh, migrants, uh, well, I mean, that's his narrative, is how migrants are, uh, in a way, really kind of in this limbo of uncertainty, ambiguity, despair. Uh, so this this doesn't really mix with DTS message. So so um, this is something that we really had to take into consideration. Uh, uh, similarly, this is Artur Mijewski, a uh, Polish artist. Um, now we come to Teresa Malgoyes, um, and she's an artist that I... Uh, that, I, that is in my portfolio and that I uh, manage uh, very intensively because she's very active. Um, that she's in a lot of museum exhibitions and I really want to talk about her as an example how um, we not only are interested in selling the work and presenting it wherever we can, but also in order to earn the trust of the artist to uh, actually show her that we understand what it is about and that we also are kind of, kind of gatekeepers for her. Um, this, uh, by the way, is Lain Draga, it's from, um, it, it, she created in the years 2016 to 17, 18, um, and uh, it's taking, these are, this man is uh, standing at the Colombian-Venezuelan border, and uh, Teresa, who you already know a little bit from Adriana's uh, presentation, um, there's, there's a, a performative aspect sometimes in her work. Uh, usually it's very understated, like in um, in uh, area, uh, Ida, and um, but here of course it's a little bit more, um, it's a little bit uh, more uh, hands on. Um, so Teresa is a, is also at the same time a political activist in a way. So it really borders on political activism, and uh, she went to the Venezuelan um, Colombian border. Where, um, as you know, due to the economic circumstances and the starting from the 2015s, a lot of Venezuelans um, crossed over to, to Colombia to escape the economic crisis there. Um, and uh, as it happens, a lot of these young men actually got stuck at the border uh, and they didn't have an opportunity to move on because they didn't have money. Um, and Teresa went up to him and she gave them little jobs. She, she gave them little performances that they could do, or she um, uh, asked them to help other um, immigrants to, or other migrants to um, move their stuff across the border. Hence the title line, Traga, delivery. Um, and for each, each task that they finished, she gave them money. Not, not much, but it was enough for them so that after some time they had built up enough, uh, built up enough money to actually then continue their um, their journey. And um, when, so at that point where they came to, where they came to this, um, um, when they had enough money to leave, uh, Teresa asked, in this case, this young man to take off his shirt. And then this, this t-shirt, which was very sweaty from the tasks that he had um, done, and anyways, from the circumstances they were in, um, she she poured them into these concrete cubes, and she did this um, over a hundred times. So in the end, um, there was an entire there was an entire collection of cubes of sweaty t-shirts uh, in well with sweaty t-shirts in them. 
and at the same time, uh, Teresa took an image of this person uh, when they took off their shirt. And it was also a symbol for their vulnerability because it's a, it's a very vulnerable moment when you take off your clothes and for a second you don't see if, uh, if somebody is, if something is coming, if there's danger. So um, you see how in a very subtle way she, she uh, captured their, their situation. And at the same time, she actually helped them uh, financially um, to overcome their, um, their situation. This is the cube. There's the initials of the um, person. Uh, and this work that now in the exhibition is home together with Beatriz Gonzalez, which uh, actually looked, and this are the works on the right, unfortunately, a little small, they're works on paper. Um, and these works are actually looking at the opposite side or at an opposite side of this whole um, uh, circumstance at the Colombian Venezuelan border. These are Colombians that when Venezuela was doing extremely well, um, it was actually more custom for Colombians to go to Venezuela and work there. And um, of course, uh, pretty much overnight, they all had to pack their stuff and go back sometimes after decades of having been there, go back to Colombia. And um, these uh, almost iconic figures on papers, typical for Beatriz, are um, these, these migrants and um, it's, in a, a blood-like paint, she painted it. So that's why you have an oxidation effect. Um, this is Adrian Pazzi, this is an Albanian artist, just to show you that the, the whole exhibition was about this, this topic. Um, I briefly talked about Joao Modi already. So um, he's a Brazilian modernist that, um, if you know Brazilian modernism, there's actually a connection to Switzerland because one of the founding members, Mira Chandel, is a Swiss immigrant to Brazil. Uh, and I believe there's really, if you look at the work, if you look at this, uh, the, uh, the constructivism in Switzerland in the mid 20th century, that uh, you have clearly this, this connection of dedication to form geometry. However, you, you have this, I would say, kind of almost this Latin twist that, uh, that Joao, of course, works in imperfect symmetries and with found materials and uh, with, with materials that make sense from where he's coming from. And um, it's to him also, it, it's about creating kind of like this magic organic uh, look to a work. Um, Dagoberto Rodriguez, Cuban artist, uh, he is, um, a good example how even though we uh, work commercially and show the work commercially or trying to sell it, well, we're selling it at fairs. We actually very prominently showed this work at this year's Art Basel. So all of the, all of the examples you see are very from this year. Um, and um, which is a relatively bold decision for a gallery to work, to, to show such a political work. Uh, we're not the only gallery who does that, but still some, some people say, well, you know, I want to see art. I don't want to be confronted with politics. Uh, but Peter um, has this tradition of um, including non, the non-Western canon and uh, non-Western perspective and pointing the finger at political topics. And um, uh, this is a large watercolor. It's over two meters tall. Uh, and uh, Dagoberto here, he drew um, the Rohingya refugee camp uh, in the aesthetic of uh, Lego, Lego bricks. Uh, and his comment about this is that, um, that refugees are actually used, uh, well, first of all, we, we see it as a, uh, in an abstract way through social media, through the news, we're, we're distant. Uh, it's almost to us, to us, it's almost like a, um, a, toy, a toy city when we see it. Uh, but at the same time, refugees are used as political uh, kind of play stones, as, um, as a political means to put other people under pressure. Um, and it's way it's tragic. Um, and this is what uh, Bando is showing here. This is actually uh, Havana, and it's also from Dagoberto. Uh, now, Havana is not really a refugee camp, but he's saying due to the economic situation in Cuba, a lot of people leave their um, their uh, surrounding, their their homes, and they move to Havana in the hopes that they can catch a boat 
to uh, the US or well, wherever where they find the bear love. Uh, Teresa Margoyes, uh, again, works that we show at fairs that are not easy. Um, these are uh, transgender women um, in Mexico. And I could show you a few more examples. And the places where they meet, their uh, clubs have been destroyed by, by gangs and uh, by, by the violence that they are surrounded with. Uh, 32 años, um, a superb work by Teresa that really shows how in this very understated uh, way, she kind of shows the horror of the violence in Mexico and uh, the adjacent areas. Um, so uh, again, so for this work, which was just, which is actually exhibited right now at Kutzbaus Düsseldorf, um, I, as, the, as her artist liaison, had to make sure that not only the transport happened, um, smoothly, but also that when the work is at the museum, it's presented in an appropriate way. I have to understand that Teresa wants that people walk around this floor and uh, talk about what is happening here. The title Trente dos Años is because one of her very good friends uh, in 2000s, well, in, in the early 2000s, was actually shot there um, on this floor. And this is where they found them. So she took um, the bricks from this floor and uh, made a work out of it. And um, this kind of brings me to a point where, you know, we ha have to ask the question, well, you know, how much can you sensationalize violence? Uh, and Teresa is an excellent um, example for this. Um, so we are a Swiss gallery where we're giving a voice to Teresa, who is a Mexican artist. She's, she's seen alone. Uh, Mexican artist, she, she, she was there in Mexico, uh, experienced the violence, she knows the, uh, the matter, she knows people who are affected. Um, so we believe that she kind of has this, intri this uh, intrinsic um, access and right to uh, tell the story of that, of that um, place and um, the history of violence. Um, but at the same time, so what what we uh, have to do as as art, as galleries that are in Europe, um, we have to make sure that it's not people are, are attracted to work in the appropriate way. And uh, the reason why this image that I'm showing this image uh, this is uh, from the series Autoretratos from the late '90s, when she used to go into. Um, and she actually posed with uh, the half decomposed bodies that they were, that were found on the streets and uh, around the cities. And I actually just this morning decided to put this uh, pink uh, field there um, be uh, because um, it, it's a it's a very harsh image, uh, and it's. Uh, it's it's funny because maybe a couple years ago I wouldn't have done that, but I, I have a four year four year old daughter and she's holding a, a young girl there, and it's, so it kind of touches me now in a different way. Uh, and I thought, okay, no, I cannot show this in a public um, presentation without kind of the people consenting to it beforehand. But you can find the image online; it's it's uh, it's no problem. Um, so concluding to kind of um, what, what, what I kind of want to say about what, what we do in, within the gallery and particularly the artist liaison is that um, in order to really um, represent these artists, work with them, earn their trust, uh, there are kind of these two factors that you have to consider and the work that you have to do. Um, there are the, what I would call the hard factors. You know, you can, you can, you can research the artist, you can research their biography, you can research the, their socioeconomic uh, um, background and environment, you can research the history of the country, you can look at what, okay, what are the logistics around, um, what, what do they have available, how can they produce the work that they want to produce, how can we help them. Um, then the, but then there are the, the soft factors, which I think are much more important uh, in order to create this sustainable relationship 
which is that you really understand their personal narrative and that you, you respect it, uh, that you consider these cultural factors. So meaning me as a Swiss slash Swiss American that I um, understand that I have to be careful with the words that I choose to talk about a work, that I have to be careful with their perspective, not assume, always check. Um, and um, I have to, um, of course, uh, invest the time um, to actually really gain their trust. And uh, this is a long organic process. Um, and we, within the uh, 10 to 15 artists that I work with, it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, it's, with each one of them, it's different. There's no recipe. Um, and um, so maybe um, we can talk about, um, well, this means that uh, you really have to uh, protect their creative agency, uh, the sovereignty of their creative agency. And this is maybe against what some people believe what galleries do. So to me, it's very, very important to convey this message that this is actually what we do. Um, maybe the outlook, um, because we talked a little bit about the Latin American art, uh, market and how it has changed um, or how it is changing. Um, we touched on the diversification that has driven galleries to um, well diversify their portfolio. Uh, it's been mentioned in the uh, Art Basel uh, market report from last year. Um, and uh, Elise also already talked about this interna internaliza interna internationalization <laughs> that has been, that is happening uh, amongst these artists. So again, this, this um, uh, label Latin American um, art and artist is, um, is really changing and, and growing. Um, and maybe, uh, I mean, me as someone who works in the contemporary art gallery, we always look at what, what's new, what is happening right now to us. Whatever happened two years ago, it's pretty much old news. Um, so uh, just uh, 10 days, I got sent this book uh, by Fido. And I actually, I brought it here. So it's, it's quite big and heavy. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's more kind of like an encyclopedia. Uh, each uh, page has um, the profile of one artist, so it's, it's not it's not extremely deep, um, but um, you should really just see the whole variety and um, the activity of um, this particular sector, or, or what we consider a sector in, um, in the art field. You also see how uh, there's many young artists that some of them don't even live in Latin American countries anymore. They live in New York, uh, they live in Europe, they live in, um, in, in other parts of the world. Um, but I think it is a very positive outlook on uh, the health of uh, this particular uh, field in, in, uh, within the art market. That's it. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this deep insight into your work. Uh, uh, it was interesting to hear your your uh, CV that you started in an auction house, and then from the secondary market, you wanted to have more contact with artists and exchange to the primary market, which is the gallery. And now you really showed us that your contact, your your relationship. Is, is really intimate, the liaison, as you call it, uh, building trust, and of course, the soft factors are the real hard ones. <laughs> yes. the story, you know. um, but I would ask you also, in view of Anatina's uh, uh, presentation, which will follow right now uh, on digitalization, are the the, the 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 is the border between secondary and primary market so between auction house and gallery not blurry currently uh you have a point do you um, have relationships with auction house or you do you enter the secondary market we do and um yeah. I'm, so i'm really um uh, absolutely willing to discuss all the, the the questions i think people have about the commercial aspect of um, this field, 
um, because it it is really very it is very pragmatic, um, and in the end, you know, um, we try to finance our artists. You know, we try to finance ourselves, uh, the artists, to provide them with means to produce and to to well actually to live, um, and um, of course. You know, there is this kind of like tension between galleries and auction houses. Um, it's... I'm a pragmatist, I worked at auction houses. So um, I'd say, you know, we should kind of like all work together where it makes sense. I mean, uh, it, it's really, it's a channel where, you know, we cannot control where all the work goes. Uh, we would like to, we would like to um, for the artists, um, but it's impossible. And so I'd rather have the work ends up in a good auction house and is, uh, I mean, I worked in an auction, so I know they are experts. Uh, we, we, I mean, I wrote catalogs as well and um, the, the work is taken care of relatively well. Um, but um, it, yeah, I mean, to, to, to answer your question, yes, auction houses have also been diversified. That's basically the response to it, yeah. And galleries too. So I see more and more connections through digital because auction houses were faster in digitized, digitalized, mm -hmm. you know, uh -huh. so uh, it's more and more I see both collaborating also with big auction houses. Uh, I think what's very interesting with auction houses or general, well, generally the, the art market, you know, it kind of, you know, whether you like it or not, at the end, it's always kind of like the market that, I mean, I don't want to sound at all like a neocon, I'm not at all, uh, but there is just a kind of regulatory aspect of the market uh, for instance, um, this discussion whether um, Latin American artists should be their own field or not. I mean, as soon as, a, as soon as a Latin American artist hits, I don't know, 10 million market value, Frida Kahlo, you know, they're not in the Latin American art auction anymore. They're in the, in, in the modernist sale or in the contemporary art sale. So, I mean, again, there's this arbitrariness, like how do you decide what is what? And um, it, it's just interesting to look at. And digitalization, yes, of course. I mean- We'll it, talk about it now. It, exactly, it's all about information and, and that's yeah. where you get it with-, with But we are impressed by the artists you're supporting, also the political activist artists. I mean, this is not so common. So it, this I'm is really Peter, impressed. yes, so- And Omid has a special interest in mm -hmm. your uh, Beatrice Gonzalez and Teresa yeah. Colboy, yes, because he wrote his thesis on the xenophobia of uh, Colombians towards Venezuelans. I know, actually in my research for today, I stumbled upon Omid's uh, doctorate. <laughs> uh, and um, I was very, um, I mean, I, I didn't have time to read it all, but I wanted to actually mention it to him after this That's conversation and go up to him, but I was very- Because I was, you know, it was, Bi-directional. It yes. was Colombians yeah. going to Venezuela, with exactly. Venezuela, and yeah. now it's the other yeah. way around. And he tries to include the 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 Venezuelan, the, the Colombian emigration to improve, or, I mean, to lessen, to decrease the xenophobia of Colombians yes. today. Yes. You mm. know, to remember what it was. So those two artists really did this job, you know, it's really interesting. This yes. Yeah. And it was very exciting to hang their works next to each other. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, and, uh, you know, this, this work was about But they struggle. didn't work together. No, they don't no. know each other. Um, you connected the two. Yes, yes. we did. Yeah. 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 I mean, also, I mean, Beatrice is 90. Yeah. And Teresa is 60. Sure. So <laughs> there's a, there's an age difference there. Yeah. Any questions to our practitioner? <laughs> No? Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. Thank and you. we move on to digitalization. To, I mean, it's uh, she's literally <laughs> online, <laughs> you know, she's not here physically. She chose her topic and her format, you know. <laughs> and Latina, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> um the the forum is the content, or how does it go? I don't I don't remember. So I, I welcome you warmly to my top to my talk, and I would like to thank uh, Yvette Sanchez very warmly for including me in this wonderful event. And I'd also like to apologize for not being there in presence. I would have loved to, but I had also meetings here, so I, I'm very sorry that I couldn't make it next time. I hope. And um, we apologize for the A at the end and not the E in your last name. You know. Yeah. 
that, that's that's completely okay. I like Elna much better. It's a it's a it's another A in my name, and uh, I, I I think it's uh, it fits well. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, the the title of my talk is Art and Digitization. And I would like to um, explore a question with you, and that is whether the recent digitization contributes to link different geographic regions better together. And um, my perspective is a sociologist's perspective. I haven't finished thinking about this topic yet, and I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts as well. So keep in mind that these are somehow reflections that I am currently involved in, but that I don't have the final answer to this question, whether digitization actually contributes to diversification of uh, the art world in terms of geography. I would uh, like to structure my talk as follows. I will first outline the dynamics of the conventional or offline art world. And I would highlight particularly two points, namely that the art sector can be viewed as a self-referential network. What does this mean? This means that artistic success is often defined in terms of who do artists relate to? Do they relate to uh, prestigious museums, to prestigious galleries? And thus the whole art sector has this somewhat self-referential tendency. If you compare this to sports, for instance, you can easily measure um, sport, sport a success a success in the sport uh, domain by measuring the athletes, I don't know, height or like how high he can jump or how fast he can run. This in the art world is not the case. You, you, the artistic success is relational in a sense. And then I would like to highlight a second point, and that is that this art world, even though it is diversifying or internationalizing, uh, it's still geographically centralized. Then I would like to look at digitization and we see that there are new actors emerging and also I think new dynamics. And then the third point is that I would like to raise the question, does digitization promote decentralization and better connection of non-European regions and in particular the Latin American region that we are concerned with today to these art centers? How is an artwork different from an ordinary everyday object? Arthur Danto, in his seminal article in 1964, wrote the following. He said that uh, to define an artwork or an artwork is different from an ordinary object through a theory of art that is established by an art world. Thus, there are two elements to this definition. There is an art world uh, that consists of a multiplicity of actors, galleries, museums, curators, art magazines, collectors, art critics, uh, and so forth. And this art world establishes a theory or has a sh shared understanding by which it delimits certain artifacts that are then considered art from artifacts that are not considered art. I think the strength of this definition or this theory established by Arthur Danto is that it allows to somehow make sense or delimit clearly what we consider art and it somehow conforms to our to our everyday um, experience of art. So we can, for instance, delimit the ready-made objects by Duchamp from uh, ordinary daily life objects. We can delimit the, the, the bananas that are artworks from those that we eat. However, it's also what, what I would like to say is that it's also a, a shortcoming and that is that it shifts the definition of artworks entirely to the reception process. So the artworks or artists' inherent concerns or inherent characteristics uh, do not feature in this, in this definition. Nonetheless, we will take this definition as a starting point for the following. Um, starting from this definition, the next question is how do actors become central in this art world? How does one actor become part of this art world that can define what is art and what is not? Me, for instance, I don't have the capacity to say, okay, this banana will now sell for five thousand dollars. And and so this this how does one get to become part of this art world? And the answer to this is that actors are uh, get involved in this art world by relating to other actors. So actors become important actors by relating to other important actors. And this is what I meant initially with this self-referential quality of artistic networks or also art worlds. 
This can also be seen that typical measures of artistic success are inherently relational. So if you have to somehow uh, understand how successful an artist is, you look at mentions in art magazines or exhibitions in renowned museums or galleries. The self-referential quality of artistic worlds has uh, different uh, consequences. One is that innovation tends to be rather slow and gradual in these established art worlds, because no actor is powerful enough to establish something as an artwork, but depends on others agreeing with his or her evaluation of an artifact. Um, actors tend to be cautious in promoting new artistic uh, works. So they, they will try to align their judgment with what's going on around them. And uh, I have here a quote uh, by uh, that, is, that is from the literary, literary world, but I think it also uh, describes or applies nicely to the artistic world. So uh, what uh, Mark Verbaud wrote is a critic's authority depends in part on the approval of other actors in the field. Therefore, a critic will see to it that his opinions do not deviate too much from the mean evaluations as this would jeopardize his credibility. To reduce uncertainty, he or she keeps a sharp eye on contextual indicators of the nature and quality of literary works, reputation of the publishing house, earlier works by the same authors, the opinions of colleagues, reviewers, jury members in literary contexts, compilers of anthologies, and even the ideas of agents working in other institutions in the literary field. So because all of these actors in an art world need to mind their own reputation or their own um, standing in the field, they need to be reluctant or they are reluctant in promoting risky propositions. The second consequence of the self-referential quality of artistic networks is that there is a reluctance of very central actors to connect to actors that are not so central in the network. So if you imagine a, a very established gallery that, that looks at new artistic propositions, it might also be risky to, to somehow connect to somebody that has no connections whatsoever. So usually what happens is that artists somehow graduate through the network, starting with uh, perhaps more avant-garde galleries and then gradually working their ways up to the center of the, of the network. <clears throat> Here, for instance, you have uh, an artwork network of organizations in Bogota. In green, you have the foundations, in orange, the galleries, in purple, the independent art spaces, and in pink, the museums. And the, the lines between them are cooperation links. And what you would see if you would analyze this network is that um, more central organizations are more reluctant to connect to those not so much at the center, while those at the margins of the network they would try to connect to those at the center. And this also is reflected a bit in the geographic centralization of this art world. So because art or artworks is probably originally a European or a Western, a Western concept, the centers of this art world are in Europe and in, in the US. And it is difficult for artists from the periphery of this network to somehow establish connections to the center. They have here some numbers showing this for the commercial side of this art world. So here we have from the UBS art market report, um, because these are reliable numbers, um, the global art market share by value in 22. And what you see is that the US has 45%, UK 20%, China 17%, uh, France 7%, and then follow Germany, Switzerland, and Spain, and then other uh, these include Latin America, Africa, and Asia, other than China, Japan, and South Korea, amounts to only 6%. Now, you might say, okay, this is 2022, but actually, this centralization has been quite stable. Here, you have uh, the, the years from 2012 to 2021, and you see the shares for the US, China, UK, and other. So basically, you have, you have a high geographic centralization in this art world. Now, why is this so? So if you imagine the art global art world as a, as a network, you could say that the reasons could be twofold. One, the center is reluctant to connect to the periphery. And you can think of various reasons why this might be the case. So for instance, 
that artistic representation and idealization of the exotic has a long tradition in Europe. So if you think of the Fauves and Goga and so on, so, so the exotic has always been somehow the counter factual scenario against which Western art has been presented. Then art from other regions is often not perceived as art, but is exhibited in museums of ethnology or ethnography. And then uh, I think in, 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 when, when the, in the 80s, there was a tendency to portray art as or art from, for instance, Latin America as Latin American art in so-called survey shows, which is homogenizing and does not do justice to the artist and so forth. So you have different kind of mechanisms that contribute for artists from the periphery not to be uh, perceived at, this, at, as, at the same level or in the same manner as artists from Europe and the US. I also saw in recent exhibitions, which I found intriguing, that some curators are moving away from denominating or showing artists origin at all, which I find interesting in a way because uh, you then don't categorize these artists as a spectator. On the other hand, it also makes it difficult to contextualize an artist's work. So it's, it's both sides. The second reason is also that you can imagine that it's hard for the periphery to establish links to the center. So uh, there's a lack of resources sometimes in the periphery for art or for contemporary art, and it is costly to travel or to somehow ship the whole exhibitions or artworks to Paris or to New York. And you can see this centralization or the lack of, say, infrastructure if you ask where are the largest art fairs, and clearly they continue to be in Europe and the US. Then correspondingly, where do the largest galleries that attend these art fairs uh, come from or where are they based? We, saw, we hear it from Yvette that there were lots of Latin American galleries at Art Basel this year, but I, I would say these are still uh, underrepresented. Then where are the artists based represented by these galleries? Uh, the artists represented in the galleries, although there are exceptions such as uh, Kirchmann Gallery, um, they are usually representing uh, artists from where they are based from. And where do the consumers in these largest galleries come from? Well, the consumers of the galleries, they're also looking for, for artists they are familiar with and thus from the same cultural context. So these are all mechanisms that contribute to somehow decentralizing tendencies. And the question is whether the recent digitization uh, that we saw during the pandemic contributes to somehow counteract these tendencies. And here, uh, I, oh, before I, I, I go into this, I would like to ask you, or perhaps I, I don't have so many pictures of artists, but uh, um, artists that always strike me as being somehow similar in visual impression, but very differently re received or also exhibited is, um, this one, perhaps somebody knows this artist? Anyone? No. So this would be Francis Bacon, and he is very well known. And sometimes I'm struck by how similar his works look to me to this artist. And this is a Colombian artist called Luis Caballero. He works also in a similar manner. So he's like working on the human body and distortions and so on. And um, uh, I'm sometimes uh, intrigued by how differently they are received. Um, yes, but the original question was, how does this increased digitization that we saw during the pandemic counteract the geographic centralization? And here I have, again, some figures from the Art Market Report in 22. And what you see on the left is uh, the numbers from 19, the share of dealer sales by value by sales channel. And what you see is 40% are sold in the gallery, overseas fairs account for 27%, local art fairs for 15, online viewing rooms in art fairs 1%, online internal uh, um, sales is 8%, and online third-party platforms 4%. So this amounts to around 13% sold online in 2019 uh, against 39% sold online in 2020. Uh, and, and that is quite striking. Uh, and if you look at the numbers for 2023, it seems to be the case that they are not going back to offline uh, sales, uh, but that online sales are going to stay. And there are some different actors or different actors have emerged. So conventional actors at an online presence, galleries, art first and auction house added online viewing rooms, 
but also new actors emerge. There are galleries who don't have a physical presence, but are only active online. There are online marketplaces, online auctions, online auction aggregators, and online gallery aggregators. And interestingly, and perhaps importantly, social media platforms such as Vimeo, Instagram, or, and, and so on, Tumblr, uh, also um, allow for a disintermediation of the market. So um, artists can actually put their content online without the help of a gallery, and this allows to connect them directly to consumers. What is furthermore, and what I find interesting is that in these online platforms or in these online social media, particularly popularity governs. And this is quite in contrast to prestige that we see in the offline art world. Popularity means that everybody sees who is liked most and more is more. And it also means a winner takes it all. So if you have something that is clicked often, it is clicked even more. What we saw on, in the beginning of this presentation uh, with the self-referential quality of art networks is uh, somehow a prestige dynamic. More presence is not necessarily better. Prestige means that one needs to be in the right place at the right time rather than everywhere at once. And, and this dynamic is, is quite different. So in an online in an online setting on an online platform, it's important to somehow be surprising, to be present, to, to have everybody's attention. And in an offline art world, it's important to be in the right museum and in the right gallery to connect to the right people to gain prestige. And so in, in these online uh, platforms, there might also be a potential shift of power to define what is considered art to consumers rather than experts. As I said, these online platforms might allow for this intermediation. And if it's uh, the, the, the amount or the, the number of clicks that gives a, an, an object the status of art rather than a certain set of expert institutions that define it as such, then this really makes the whole dynamic that uh, of, of defining art quite different. What is furthermore that is, is innovation in online systems tends to be very different. So rapid and uh, unusual and surprising content is more successful in online environments where collective intent shifts ever more rapidly. So this means that, that you have much quicker or more, more rapid innovations. And one example of, of this would be, for instance, the NFT boom that, that we have seen in 2021. So there was, for instance, the, 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 were, the NFTs are non-fungible tokens, and it allows to make digital um, content uniquely identified and thus transactable. So you can sell a PDF and you can be sure that this PDF, you, you own the only PDF of this. And one example of this would be the Sport Ape series. So these are basically comics uh, and they have been sold as, as, as non-fungible tokens and have sold between 1 million and 4 million. And the main endorsers of these uh, board apes were not necessarily the classical institutions, but were celebrities. And so the shift that there has been, at least in this case, some shift from the definitory power of from, from classical art institutions or classical art world actors towards more consumer. And that dynamic I find very interesting. And the question that arises for me is whether the digital, but whether this is also a chance for artists from peripheral regions or from Latin America. So you have digital platforms that make physical travels unnecessary. You have a, perhaps a shift from prestige to popularity that allows to popularize content irrespective of connections to recognized sectors. So say a, a Latin American or a Colombian artists do not need to be exhibited at the Louvre in order to gain prestige. And that's, but it, it, it is okay if they have, or like they, they get also the necessary attention just by having a lot of followers locally. And thus I would think, or I, I'm asking whether this could also be a chance for artists in the periphery. I thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your feedback and questions. And I'm working on a, in a book book chapter, Art as a Relational Good, for which these reflections are a basis and any feedback you may have is very helpful in this, in this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Anatina, for this other uh, insight into the art market after Thomas's uh, insight. Uh, uh, 
we are backwards, we're going back to theory uh, and concepts uh, with Elena, but sticking a little bit to this topic, I'm sure it was quite provocative, your thesis, I think. I, let's see whether there's some questions or contestations. No? I have, I have. <laughs> It wasn't meant to be provocative, and I'm I'm like interested in any questions or, or critis criticisms you may have. Because you know, digitalization is not only about what you talk. It's not only about NFTs and clicks. Uh, it is about much more. I mean, if you look at auction houses and galleries today, uh, there's other there's other movements. You know, I mean, look at the all the metaverse galleries of the big auction houses, for instance. You know. Uh, um, Sotheby's has opened one, Christie's had op has opened one. So there's there's much more to digitization than those two aspects you mentioned. And then I think a, a critical observation would be a mind of the, the bipolarization or the dichotomy of center and periphery, uh, because by using this, uh, you, are, you are supporting marginalization. You know, I think it's not such a black and white uh, yeah, uh, constellation, you know. I mean, we try to get away from center and periphery. We had it already with Elisi today. So that's a, that's a, a, a tricky one. And then as to the Art Basel, you know, Art Basel Miami is Latin America. But I was surprised how many Latin American galleries were in Basel too. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's our Basel Miami where Latin America is the protagonist. You know? So that was the point. And uh, yeah. I can throw in something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be uh, relatively, well, I don't know, careful with kind of uh, mixing the, the um, attention economy of. NFTs, social media, uh, and the kind of um, structures you have in the traditional gallery system and, and institutions. Um, kind of, well, shortly said, you know, you can have 50,000 or 500,000 followers on Instagram, um, but that doesn't really say much about the quality of your work um, because, you know, all of these 50 or 1,000 people they might not understand anything about art. Whereas if you have 50 followers, but they are, you know, 20 of them are curators and 10 of them are museum directors and the rest is collectors, then you're in a far better position to, yeah. to actually um, succeed. Footnote, uh, footnote uh, Roman Signal, 60 million clicks for his performance in Malmö. Uh, that's what you meant, I think. I mean, it's not about numbers only and about clicks, uh, etc. You know, I mean, because those people who were among those 60 million, they're not really art to find, you know? <laughs> yes, and also, um, I mean, you know, the bored apes, they kind of really are actually an example of, well, bad art, you know, and, and bad NFTs. And well, I mean, I'm, you know, that's just, uh, you can, you can, you can tell it's, it's, uh, it's an emotional topic for us gallerists, not because we are actually, not because we are afraid, but more kind of like we want to really make sure that we're not being, like we, we want to kind of like draw a line between us and, uh, and uh, NFT art, because um, yes, there's a certain democ democratization, um, but um, it's completely unregulated. And, you know, it's, there. there's pros and cons to that, but, Again, you know, there's a reason why they are. I mean, you know, everybody in uh, in the NFT world who says they're they're so glad there are no gatekeep gatekeepers. What are they doing? They're going to look for the gate gatekeepers of the NFT world. You know, they they're going to instead of a an educated well, instead of a, an experienced curator, they're listening to a celebrity. So th you kind of see my point. Yes, yes. These these are all very very interesting thoughts. I I no look I. I'm I'm 
basically you, you speak from the from my heart or like you speak to my heart i i don't want i don't like the nfts i don't like the board apes i'm very glad that that uh, you draw a line between this but it's also somehow interesting this dynamic and well I, okay i i'm should i try to respond or should i like yeah okay so okay i'm going from uh, yvette's comments and i work my way uh, to thomas comments so i um of course um conventional or traditional or however you want to call uh, these art institutions have added online presence but they've only done so in the pandemic they were extremely reluctant in contrast to other industries if one can compare the art to other industries to do so before. So other other say consumer industries have, have been active online much, much earlier. So I find this reluctance already interesting. And I think that actually these online activities or this this online presence doesn't need to be a, a threat or it doesn't need to be, but apparently I, my feeling if you if you read uh, that the literature sometimes it's perceived as such. And then I am totally on board with this unlucky um, dichotomy or bipolarization between uh, periphery and uh, periphery and center. However, if I want to say that some things are happening more in Europe and US, I, I somehow have to find a term to, to, to describe this. And, and that's, that's, that's not so easy or that, that if you look at the numbers for turnover in the, in the art market, there, there seems to be places where more is happening than others. And, and somehow I, I wanted to describe this, but I, I agree with that. And uh, then with res respect to these, uh, this, the, 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 the two things, attention economy and bus in contrast to aura, um, I, I, I think that Perhaps these are really two different logics. So one is about connecting to 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 experts, connecting or like ex, ex, uh, to somebody who has a standing in the field, and ma making sure that you are somehow connected to the right places. And one is just connecting to anybody and having more attention. And I think these two logics are very different, and I agree with that. And I know that there are some celebrities who have more followers as well, and then um, figure as somehow gatekeepers. But but I would I would say these are really two different logics, and I find it interesting that they at the moment seem to coexist somehow, even overlap. Because say for instance the board apes, I think they were auctioned off by Christie's first, but also endorsed by celebrities. So they have there is this overlap, and these traditional art world actors they are also trying, for instance, to partake in this NFT boom or tried to partake in this NFT boom. And so they, 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 there is this um, concern to also be in this online world and to somehow also be present there. So I think th these are two logics and I, it will be interesting how it plays out. And and uh, yeah, I don't know. Good. Adriana, last. Um, thank you. Uh, Anantino. And I have yeah, a question yeah, with related this, uh, with this uh, dichotomy between consumers and experts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would like to know a little bit more uh, uh, about this radical distinction uh, in this form. And I will ask where to put you in this dichotomy. I guess I am neither. I, I am not an art collector, and uh, but I would probably be somebody that likes stuff on social media. So in terms of attention economy, I would be a consumer. And I would not be an expert because I have no institutional affiliation to any art world actor that is that is somehow active in that. But but I, I think the perhaps you raise an important point. Maybe the, the world is not so dichotomous. I mean, Sotheby for sure has a social uh, media presence and the galleries have so too. And I would assume that they have more followers than me, say for instance, and, and that their opinion is also valued in a different way. And well, if, if you look at it, uh, if there, there, is a, there is a report looking at what do consumers or art collectors follow and 
it's still the traditional art actors that they follow or that they look at also online and in on social media when they decide what to buy so i think it needs not to be such a dichotomous uh, perhaps i over uh, exaggerated a bit this dichotomy and maybe these two worlds uh, is is a bit the each is a bit an extreme and the the true reality is perhaps a bit in the middle or something like that i'm not sure whether i responded well to that question Indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anna Tina. You're welcome. Thank you very much to your questions. And... Elena and then you don't. The de oro. Bueno, tú eres el pre-broch. Es igual. Creo que es Mientras tanto, eh, como introducción, diré que yo no voy a hablar de lo que hago específicamente, eh, porque bueno, yo trabajo sobre arte contemporáneo eh, y violencia, representación de la violencia, fundamentalmente en América Latina y en España, pero eh, lo que pensé que tenía más sentido traer hoy aquí era un pequeño panorama eh, sobre la idea de arte latinoamericano, que creo que va a recoger muchas de las cosas que, que hemos estado hablando y seguramente va a dejar muchas más preguntas, eh, porque no vengo con ninguna respuesta. Y obviamente voy a volver a cambiar de idioma, eh, eh, pero eso, tengo en el PowerPoint un poco lo que voy a decir en, en inglés, por si alguien necesita ese apoyo y voy a leer porque creo que si no me puedo ir por las ramas y lo que queremos es llegar a, a Rodrigo. Sí. <ríe> Así que bueno, lo que, lo que propongo hoy es reflexionar sobre la idea de arte latinoamericano y cuestiones históricas, teóricas y disciplinarias del campo de la historia del arte eh, latinoamericano que considero importantes a la hora de acercarnos a estudiar o simplemente a contemplar obras de arte latinoamericano contemporáneo, específicamente. Eh, y la advertencia que, que acabo de hacer, no vamos a llegar a ninguna definición estable de lo que es el arte latinoamericano. Eh, primero porque me parece absurdo y segundo porque tampoco la hay. Eh, y sin embargo lo que me parece más importante es entender los procesos, los debates y los contextos en los que esta idea se ha, se ha desarrollado. Así que voy a empezar, si funciona, <risa> por las preguntas. A lo mejor solo, sí, sí. Es muy bien, si lo das. Ah, vale. Listo. Pues estas serían como las preguntas para empezar. ¿Qué es el arte latinoamericano? ¿Cómo podríamos definirlo? ¿Existe el arte latinoamericano como expresión artística diferenciada? Eh, y qué aporta esta categoría o etiqueta a las prácticas y discursos artísticos que los artistas latinoamericanos despliegan en sus obras. Entonces, como seguramente todos sabemos, la etiqueta de arte latinoamericano, como tal, eh, latinoamericano, eh, surgió en Estados Unidos a finales de la década de los 30. Antes de esto, el término más utilizado todavía para el arte producido en la región era arte hispanoamericano. Eh, pero entonces, ¿a qué se refiere esa nueva etiqueta, arte latinoamericano, que surge entonces? Es, como, como preguntamos, ¿hay una categoría, categoría artística separada y distinta? ¿O se trata más bien de una etiqueta curatorial y de mercado? Eh, autores como Joaquín Barriendo se han dado a la tarea de reflexionar al respecto. Y en su opinión, eh, como podéis ver ahí, el arte latinoamericano es una categoría geoestética en la que, y le cito, se han puesto de manifiesto las jerarquías temporales y las disyunciones espaciales de nuestros imaginarios globales desde la modernidad colonialidad. El término apunta, el término arte latinoamericano, eh, por tanto apunta a una historia eh, de colonialismo en la región que sigue desarrollándose incluso después de los procesos de independencia y modernidad. Y esta cuestión, por supuesto, tiene que ver con el propio concepto de América Latina. 
eh, que como resume Damián Bayón, y cito, es una expresión un tanto convencional, acuñada sobre todo en Europa hace bueno, siglo y medio, dos siglos, para poder incluir a todos los países colonizados por españoles y portugueses, más algunas islas y zonas menores que lo fueron más tardíamente eh, por franceses, ingleses y holandeses. Entonces, la inadecuación del nombre América Latina eh, ha llevado, por ejemplo, a algunos grupos indígenas y activistas a defender el uso del término aviayala como alternativa, que en lengua cuna significa eh, tierra en su plena madurez o tierra de sangre, de sangre vital. Y es utilizado por el pueblo cuna panameño para referirse al continente americano antes de la llegada de Colón. No obstante, aunque el nombre de América Latina está plagado de conflictos, creo que de alguna manera sí nos permite considerar prácticas, artistas y contextos infrarrepresentados, excluidos o ignorados en los relatos hegemónicos de la historia del arte europea y norteamericana. Y por eso yo personalmente lo sigo utilizando. Eh, siempre siendo consciente pues, de todos estos conflictos eh, y de la implicación en la comunidad. Bueno, la identidad del arte latinoamericano eh, ocupa el centro de los debates, especialmente desde los años 70, pero con más fuerza si cabe durante los 80. Y voy a hacer una muy breve panorámica. Para Mari Carmen Ramírez, que es eh, la curadora de arte latinoamericano del Museo de Bellas Artes de Houston, este hecho tiene que ver con el legado neocolonial de Estados Unidos en la región, que cobra renovada importancia a raíz de los intereses políticos, diplomáticos y económicos de la potencia en la década del 80. Eh, Ticio Escobar, en una ponencia que presentó en el 96, expone de forma concisa la evolución del problema de la identidad. Eh, y dice, durante las primeras décadas del siglo XX, en paralelo a las vanguardias históricas, la identidad se consideraba en todas partes y también en América Latina, seña de naciones y pueblos con perfiles herméticos. Se piensa entonces que existen repertorios propios de formas y contenidos que el arte puede representar. Eh, así, el arte latinoamericano es visto entonces, a principios del siglo XX, como la expresión específica de una misma geografía que es exuberante, dramática, extensa y romántica, y una historia compartida pasado indígena, colonización, mestizaje, etc. Eh, en pos esta identidad de unos mismos sueños emancipadores. Esta concepción, afirma Escobar, condena al aislamiento, al atraso, al exotismo, al folclorismo de los artistas eh, latinoamericanos. Eh, un poquito más adelante, en las décadas centrales del siglo, se comienza entonces a buscar la superación de este atraso, atraso entre comillas, mediante la importación de formas cosmopolitas para afirmar eh, lo propio, ¿no? que es lo que presentabas tú al principio, el arte quinético, etc. Pero siempre bajo una sospecha eh, sobre la originalidad, ¿no? y aquí viene toda la cuestión de la copia, etc. Eh, después de la Segunda Guerra Mundial, el arte abstracto en América Latina se organizó predominantemente en torno a un lenguaje vis visual racional y geométrico y se consideró parte de un programa para una sociedad moderna y universal. Este lenguaje se inspiró en fuentes europeas, las vanguardias, los artistas que vivieron o estudiaron en Europa, eh, la influencia de la Bauhaus, en fin. Eh, pero también se inspiró en una recuperación de la abstracción prehispánica, sobre todo en textiles y arquitectura. Eh, ya en los años 60 y 70, las identidades pasan a expresar contiendas de un conflicto histórico contra el imperialismo y la aculturación, pues se considera entonces que el arte no está separado de su contexto social y político eh, y hacia finales de los años 70 eh, comienza entonces a cuestionarse este concepto de identidad ¿no? como seña del arte latinoamericano, además de la modernidad en general. <coughs> eh, la idea de identidad se complejiza y relativiza. Las identidades ya no son esencias históricas ni frutos de batallas heroicas e ineludibles, sino el resultado transitorio de cruces, negociaciones, estrategias eh, y accidentes, como afirma, eh, por ejemplo, Escobar. Eh, hay subjetividades diversas, sincretismo, apropiación, renovación, 
eh, y estas fueron a partir de entonces, de los 70, las claves. Eh, aunque, por ejemplo, para otros autores como Mónica Amor, eh, ambos enfoques, tanto el esencialismo como el sincretismo, eh, son igualmente esencialistas ¿no? y otrizadores. Bueno, a partir de los años 90 comienza el, el cuestionamiento del lugar de enunciación. ¿no? Entonces se habla desde América Latina. Eh, la puesta en valor de la voz del sub subalterno latinoamericano redimensiona el llamado boom del subalterno, como lo expresara Mabel Moraña, y ahora los subalternos latinoamericanos específicamente son escuchados y, sin embargo, nada modifica las lógicas de circulación ni interviene en la geopolítica global del conocimiento. Eh, como diría Pablo Elguera, todavía hay artistas que nacen en el lado equivocado de la historia. Por otro lado, eh, la cuestión de si el arte latinoamericano debería incluirse en la tradición occidental o si su relación con ella es periférica, eh, fue otro punto importante de debate eh, a lo largo de toda la segunda mitad del siglo XX. Y Mari Carmen Ramírez, por ejemplo, opina que la cultura latinoamericana se inscribe en la tradición occidental por su legado colonial y que sus especificidades tienen que ver con estrategias de apropiación <coughs> perdón, o reciclaje en relación con modelos o aspectos de la cultura euroamericana que responden a las necesidades de las realidades latinoamericanas. Bueno, por otro lado, eh, muchos autores también desde los años 60, 70, han señalado eh, lo fantástico o lo real, maravilloso, como otro aspecto fundamental de la identidad cultural latinoamericana en una versión actualizada del imaginario colonialista eh, que desde el siglo XVI eh, comienza con nuevas connotaciones mercadológicas y con una nueva estrategia discriminatoria en el mapa cultural. Eh, y esto tiene que ver también, creo, con, con el boom. Gracias, tengo. Pero me lo ha recordado. Ahora. <risa> eh, bueno, eh, Mari Carmen Ramírez, por volver a ella, enumera, por ejemplo, en esta, en esta línea de lo real, maravilloso, lo fantástico, eh, los significantes formales estereotipados de esta concepción como esencia del arte latinoamer latinoamericano, que serían colores tropicales, exuberancia cromática y compositiva o expresión salvaje de las convenciones formales. Eh, lo fantástico suele ser tropical eh, en esta concepción del mundo, eh, pero por supuesto en América Latina hay mucho más que naturaleza tropical. Eh, bueno, y como dijo por ejemplo eh, el artista brasileño Helio Oiticica, el mito de la tropicalidad es mucho más que loros y bananeros. Para Oiticica, por ejemplo, la tropicalidad era la conciencia de no estar condicionado por las estructuras establecidas y de ahí que fuera altamente revolucionaria. Y esto también es un ejemplo ¿no? de cómo los estereotipos y las categorías eh, reduccionistas en torno al arte latinoamericano también han sido apropiados por los artistas y puestos en juego como estrategias radicales. Bueno. Eh, y con Eitisica seguimos avanzando un poquito y entramos en el terreno del arte conceptual, que es muy importante o ha sido muy importante en América Latina. El conceptualismo, eh, sobre todo durante los años 60 y 70, eh, se, car se caracterizó por su intervención en los contextos sociopolíticos de la región. A diferencia de otras tendencias vanguardistas paralelas, centradas en la innovación formal, el rasgo sobresaliente de la vanguardia conceptual latinoamericana fue la fusión, como ya he dicho, entre arte y política en un proyecto socioartístico de emancipación. Eh, y como pequeño ejemplo, porque no sea tanto texto, eh, traigo esta obra que es de Silvio Meireles, eh, que en un intento de evitar la censura durante la dictadura militar en Brasil, eh, creó el proyecto Inserciones en Circuitos Ideológicos, y eh, esta obra forma parte de, esa, de ese proyecto. Eh, y en, para esta obra eh, retiró de circulación botellas de, de Coca-Cola, de vidrio, aplicó mensajes que, bueno, no se ven muy bien, pero eh, por aquí, por ejemplo, hay instrucciones para hacer eh, cócteles molotov. Eh, 
les, eh, les inscribió estos mensajes políticos sub, subversivos a, a las botellas, las rellenó y las volvió a poner en circulación. Eh, entonces, en ese momento se rellenaban, ¿no? se volvían a usar. La botella de Coca-Cola, que es un objeto cotidiano de producción masiva, eh, era también, además, símbolo del imperialismo estadounidense y del consumo capitalista. A partir de los años eh, 80 y 90, comienza a aparecer también una crítica de arte más profunda y vinculada a teorías críticas, especialmente la postcolonial, la postmoderna y la feminista. Como explica María Laura Ise, surge entonces la necesidad de revisar la historiografía del arte ligada al concepto de América Latina, que como hemos visto era englobador, al tiempo que reduccionista. Eh, el concepto de identidad, por tanto, ya en los 80-90, pierde vigencia del mismo modo que lo hacen los macro relatos modernos que lo sustentaban. Como señala Gerardo Mosquera, en un texto que titula muy significativamente Goodbye Identity, Welcome Difference, <risa> la neurosis de identidad, como la llama él, esto es, la construcción de identidades diferenciadas de resistencia frente a Europa y Estados Unidos, entra en crisis. Eh, por otro lado, a partir de 1987, más o menos, eh, se inaugura, según la literatura, eh, un boom de exposiciones de arte latinoamericano con un discurso aparentemente más abierto y más flexible que tendrá su punto álgido a principios de los 90 alrededor de las celebraciones del quinto centenario. Eh, y aparecen entonces nuevas cuestiones en torno al arte latinoamericano. Por un lado... Um, por un lado se afirma que la importancia de los procesos de hibridación es esencial, siendo nociones como las de fragmentación, diversidad, juxtaposición y collage parte de la identidad postmoderna eh, latinoamericana y en este sentido se ponen en valor procesos activos de resistencia y afirmación eh, de mestizaje, reinvención, antropofagia postcolonial o resignificación. Y por otro lado, Junto con estas cuestiones, en la estela de los discursos multiculturales de los 90, eh, comienzan a plantearse con más fuerza otras reivindicaciones, como las de los grupos indígenas excluidos de las narrativas de los estados-nación postcoloniales, o los grupos migrantes, tanto en el interior como hacia el exterior de la región, o eh, como las de la historia colonial temprana, sus tensiones y violencias eh, abordadas muy especialmente, por supuesto, alrededor de las celebraciones y las ocultaciones de esas celebraciones del quinto centenario. Bueno. Esta celebración de la hibridez y de la diferencia eh, lleva aparejada, según Mosquera, una problemática de identidad, identidad nacional carnavalizante pues en muchas ocasiones solo aquellas obras que manifiestan explícitamente su diferencia, satisfaciendo así las expectativas del exotismo, son legitimadas en el circuito internacional. A pesar de todo esto, para Mosquera el arte latinoamericano está dejando de serlo ya en los 90, gracias al creciente número de circuitos. El propio Mosquera denomina el pseudo-internacionalismo del mainstream. Eh, en este sentido, Mosquera sostiene, a mi juicio, de forma algo ingenua, que el arte latinoamericano ya no necesita declarar explícitamente su identidad para ser legitimado, aunque advierte del peligro de que, de que el cosmopolitanismo domestique esas diferencias, forzando a los artistas latinoamericanos adoptar un lenguaje internacional y posmoderno que controle la diversidad. Mosquera reconoce, en este sentido, que a pesar de que en el siglo XXI hay más pluralidad, el esquema centro-periferia, del que hablábamos ahora, sigue dominando las interacciones, puesto que las estructuras económicas y de poder se mantienen. Eh, vale la pena enfatizar que en América Latina no existe un centro, un único centro artístico, sino una red multitánica. Eh, pero una vez más, a pesar de la supuesta globalización del mundo del arte, los intercambios siguen siendo desiguales, 
y en gran parte de la región las estructuras del arte continúan subdesarrollándose. Y finalmente, eh, Barriendos advierte que, eh, y quizá esto es lo más eh, discutible o lo que más puede generar reacciones, eh, Barriendos advierte que con el uso hoy en día sobrevalorado de conceptos como trans transculturación o hibridación, América Latina está siendo reinventada y consumida como proyecto expositivo. Eh, lo que propone Barriendos o lo que, lo que él ve um, es que el arte latinoamericano contemporáneo está atrapado entre lo que en principio son dos polos opuestos. Por un lado, el problema de, de esta deslatinoamericanización que busca su lugar en el sistema global del arte y por otro lado, la consolidación de un mundo del arte latinoamericano eh, en universidades, en bienales, en ferias de arte, museos, redes de galerías y coleccionistas, etc. Eh, según Barriendos, al dejar de ser latinoamericano, el trabajo de los artistas de la región también deja de ser considerado subalterno y derivativo y produce su propia heterogeneidad a través de la apropiación y resignificación de lo global. Pero, aquí viene el pero de Barriendos, dejando de lado todo lo que resulta controvertido en torno a la globalización. O sea, también deja de ser político. Um, por otro lado, tener un mundo del arte latinoamericano propio crea un nicho de mercado que ya no está atrapado en la afirmación de la, de la identidad. Eh, por tanto, la idea de arte latinoamericano, como hemos visto, apunta a muchas tensiones históricas, políticas y estéticas, eh, y yo lo que recomiendo es tener siempre presentes todas estas tensiones eh, a la hora de observar e interpretar las prácticas artísticas creadas en, desde o sobre América Latina. Catalina, tomamos el tren rápido por el debate de varias décadas del siglo XX, sobre todo, o sea, al llegaste hasta los 90, uh, claro, habría que ver cómo es la cosa en el nuevo milenio. Sí, y, ahí es más y o con menos el, sí, Exacto, sí, pero has hablado de, las redux, de los reduccionismos y esencialismos, o sea, yo hace décadas se sí, eh, he echado sermones a los estudiantes que dejen de usar el esencialismo de la identidad, la sustituyan por identificación, belonging, etcétera, pero que dejen de la identidad. Uh, o sea, eh, eso está claro. Ahora, la pregunta al final creo que nos queda, ¿qué es el arte latinoamericano? ¿Es hecho en...? O es, y yo creo que es más bien lo segundo, uh, es todas las diásporas de los artistas, o sea, incluyendo a Rodrigo en Suiza, de los artistas, porque no es un país, o sea, hoy un artista no va a un país y se queda ahí, o sea, es, es realmente un nomadismo, o sea, son varias diásporas de un origen latinoamericano, o sea, ¿qué es al final? O sea, el, el arte latinoamericano, porque se va dividiendo claramente en las, vamos a ponerlo en las últimas dos décadas, que es lo que pasa en la literatura. No hay domicilio fijo ya en el arte latinoamericano, es decir, ¿qué es al final? ¿no? Sí, <risa> y creo que no, bueno, no sé, a mí me costaría mucho decir que eso, si realmente pensar que es algo en concreto. ¿no? Eh, son temas, son maneras de, de pensar el mundo, son maneras de expresar ese mundo. Eh, hay, o sea, creo que sí se pueden encontrar diferentes eh, estrategias artísticas o estéticas o debates que se comparten eh, ¿no? y, que, y que indican que ese, esa obra ha estado producida por alguien que está pensando en esas cosas que son importantes a lo mejor en América Latina o para América Latina y creo que puede ser interesante pensarlo así, pero más allá de eso ¿eh? A ver <risa> Adriano <risa> eh, Primero, muchísimas gracias por, por esta suerte de recorrido varias definiciones potencialmente eh, explosivo <risa> sí, eh, <risa> en conflicto o no solamente potencialmente en conflicto, pero eh, evidentemente es, un, es, una, es un, 
una cuestión que abordamos todo, sobre todo cuando estamos fuera eh, de América Latina. A mí, particularmente, eh, cuando estoy en América Latina no me definiría jamás como america, eh, latinoamericano. Es decir, eh, esto es una cuestión que me parece también eh, muy importante y que de alguna manera eh, se relaciona con esa tensión constante entre una definición endógena y una exógena. Eh, yo creo que a estas alturas ya resulta difícil decir es solo endógena o solo exógena y es, creo que en esta discusión se ve muy bien eh, precisamente ese va y ven entre una cosa y la otra. Eh, lo que me preguntaba, o mi pregunta viene del hecho de que yo trabajo literatura latinoamericana y me estoy enfrentando constantemente a todo aquello que no corresponde a unas nociones exógenas, europeas, suizas, eh, de lo que es lo latinoamericano. Y me resulta realmente bastante curioso hasta qué punto resulta muy cercano esto discutido dentro de las artes visuales y dentro de la literatura en un marco de eh, estudios culturales. Ahora bien, me preguntaba, volviendo a la cuestión de las identidades, me preguntaba hasta qué punto, aunque no lo has tratado, pero es un tema de discutir, hasta qué punto el alza de los grupos identi identitarios o los grupos de afirmación, de pensamiento, pero también de acción basado en la identidad, no vuelven de alguna manera eh, a una cuestión que parecería ya eh, cerrada, ¿no? la cuestión de la, eh, la, la tensión entre identidad y diferencia. No sé si lo has pensado, Sí, como sí. todos estos movimientos también indígenas, negros, mujeres, etcétera, que vuelven a la idea de una identidad que está basada en una experiencia compartida. Sí, o sea, sí lo he pensado. ¿no? Yo te puedo dar mis mi reflexiones sí. al respecto, que además también son muy personales. Creo que todo esto empieza con, con todo el auge del testimonio en los 90, sobre todo, eh, y tiene mucho que ver con quién puede hablar y desde dónde está hablando esta persona. Entonces, en ese sentido, y precisamente por ese auge de grupos identitarios, eh, a, mí, a mí me cuesta hablar, aparte de que me pongo muy nerviosa, pero a mí me cuesta hablar porque yo soy española, yo no soy latinoamericana, eh, y yo estoy tratando de pensar qué es el arte latinoamericano. ¿no? Entonces, yo, mi lugar de enunciación eh, se ve confrontado con, con esas identidades, ¿no? y, y muchas veces se ha confrontado fuerte. Eh, entonces sí, creo que de alguna manera es una vuelta a veces, no siempre y no en todos los casos, me parece que hay, hay discusiones muy, muy ricas y que, y que pueden dar eh, muchas cosas muy interesantes, pero hay veces que es verdad que, que se vuelve a esencializar ¿no? y se vuelve a poner la identidad de quien habla, eh, ¿no? de quien tiene derecho a, a hablar sobre algo, eh, sobre un lugar, sobre, sobre un tema que, ¿no? que toca. Eh, a esas personas. Entonces sí, es, es, es un problema, eh, no sé si irresoluble a lo mejor, ¿no? Pero, pero sí, de, que precisamente, o sea, creo que mi, mi conclusión de todo esto sería, eh, bueno, hablemos de América Latina, ¿no? de arte latinoamericano, pero sabiendo todo lo que conlleva y, y desde dónde se ha, se ha hablado, se ha definido, se ha tratado de, de pensar y y qué es lo que estamos aportando nosotros a ese debate, ¿no? Desde nuestras posiciones sí, particulares. Con, sí, concienciación, uh -huh. sensibilización. Uh -huh. Yo creo que lo de dentro y fuera, es decir, estando en Europa y hablando de lo Latinoamérica, y estando dentro y hablando de Latinoamérica, hay un caso un poco más, eh, menos, que abarca menos, que es el caso de los US latinos, que hacen que han hecho lo mismo, porque ahí tenemos hispanics, o sea, sea hispanoamericano, etc. Y ellos mismos, por tratarse de una etiqueta de mercadeo también, Together with Strong, eh, querían llamarse no hispanics, porque esto fue impuesto, eh, impuesto eh, eh, top-down por el gobierno cuando tenían que hacer los censos, eh, sino nosotros, US latinos, o sea, ya todos sabemos que latino, latinoamericano, colonialismo, pero ellos se autoimpusieron esta etiqueta 
también para vender mejor, o sea, los literatos, los artistas, o sea, una conciencia total. Por eso lo que dijiste de la etiqueta curatorial y la de mercadeo no está tan mal. O sí, sea, se usa y siempre. Y también de la academia. También, también, sí, sí, también. Sí. Lo que yo podría decir es que yo me he interesado para Renata Flores, que una um, artista de Perú me la recomendó, y quedaba fascinada con ella, una joven genio, genio. Y lo que a mí me llamó la atención de su arte en comparación a otros artes que yo veo en artistas de Suiza incluso, o por ejemplo ese de Beyoncé, que era una controversia cuando fue al Louvre, ¿no? Es como que el arte europeo del norte, los artistas, muchos de, los, de la nueva generación, se confrontan con antiguas establecidas estructuras artísticas incluso arquitectónicas. Por ejemplo, aquí en Suiza hay un grupo que se llama Chua Cena, e hicieron toda una obra de arte en cual se confrontaron con todo eso de 2014. <ríe> Muy buena la obra. Mientras que Renata Flores recoge arte, incluso va a los sitios arquitectónicos, claro, hay una aromatización, hay también un mestizaje porque lo mezcla con hip hop también y, y el acercamiento a la naturaleza, pero me, que me parece que desde su posicionalidad es más constructivo. No digo que lo hagan malo los, los de tu Atena, yo fascinada con lo que hacen, pero es que como que tiene otra voz que a mí me ha, a mí ha atrapado, como cuando la vi, porque de alguna manera trae algo de la memoria, pero lo ve desde una forma contemporánea, abierto también, eh, que no son así como que no, eso no y eso sí, como que hace hip hop, hace rap en quechua, cosas así como que no he visto que lo hagan, en, claro, hay Billie Eilish, por ejemplo, en Estados Unidos, ella eh, también mezcla los, los diferentes géneros, pero digamos, en cuanto a esa mezcla de identidades, creo que eso es muy particular en ella, pero claro, ella no representa a todos los artistas en América tampoco, pero eso sí, de lo expuesto lo podría identificar en su arte. Voy a escucharla. Pues. Sí. <risa> sí. Sí, suena muy interesante. Muchas gracias. En chat no hay nada. No. Muy bien. Entonces, gracias, Elena. Los mejores de Suiza, los mejores de Suiza, no de Maracay, no. Los mejores vienen de Sanga, no de Suiza. No, no. Hemos hecho. Hemos hecho. No, no. Hemos hecho. No, no. Hemos hecho. No, no. 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 Es que ahora... Habíamos hecho un intento de reproducir el video desde la presentación de TV y eso no resulta muy ir al... ¿En qué? Y resultó... Estaban como que tú hablas que... Pero es que tú realizas... Una cosa tremenda... Yo no sé si el PDF también funciona con esa cosa. Sí, sí, sí. 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 Sí, sí, sí.
Quizás mejor dejar, dejar el otro abierto en sí. Primero el 4A. No, el no, ese lo voy a poner después. ¿Cuántos son? Esta vez. Atención, Rodrigo. Hola a todo el mundo, muchas gracias por participar. Um, y gracias por esperar hasta este último momento sí, um, um, quiero empezar como mencionando algunas cosas que, o sea, muchas gracias también por la invitación por recibirme eh, aquí en South Gallen um, decidí empezar la, la presentación con una de estas obras que es de las más antiguas que tengo, no es la más antigua que tengo pero decidí incluirla precisamente por el tema de la, de la presentación que nos convoca ahora, por el mismo tema del trabajo con, el, con los residuos, pero también con el contexto de donde yo venía. Entonces yo soy, mi nombre es Rodrigo Toro Madrid, soy un artista de Chile, eh, egresé de la Universidad Diego Portales de Santiago en el año 2014, y después del egreso de la universidad, del bachelor, eh, fue que empecé a hacer estos trabajos que son eh, principalmente instalaciones sonoras. También trabajo con otro tipo de tecnología que tienen que ver con la óptica, tienen que ver con la producción de imágenes. Pero es mucho más fácil hacer máquinas que produzcan sonido o ruido. Y precisamente con ese tema de los recursos que hay disponibles fue que empecé a trabajar con el contexto que me rodea y yo tuve la suerte de que al lado de mi casa hay, había una chatarrería y una feria de, nosotros decimos cachureos, pero es una, fecha, una feria de cachivaches, un flea market, una feria de las pulgas. ¿En Chile o aquí? En Santiago. En Santiago. En Santiago. Justo ah. vivo al lado de la feria de pulgas más grande de todo Santiago. Entonces empecé desde muy temprano a coleccionar, a desarmar cosas y a tratar de reutilizarlas con propósitos eh, recreativos, pero después eso se transformó en mi, en mi práctica artística y lo particular que tienen todos estos materiales es que son baratos. Y eso es lo mejor de todo. Eh, el asunto de, 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 de la inexactitud de, de, del del ruido y del error en el sonido que se obtiene a través de utilizar estos objetos, eh, viene de la manualidad y, se, y viene de estos materiales que están como generalmente con derrumbre, generalmente oxidados por, el, por las condiciones climáticas, por el mal uso, por la misma razón en que estaban o en la basura o siendo revendidos. Mucha gente revende basura también. Eso también es parte de, 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 de la presencia que tienen estos materiales. Y este trabajo en particular se llama Hummingbird, número uno, 
y es un tocadiscos, así como un glorified, glorified record, record player, eh, construido en base a un polinillo de carne. Entonces, eh, todo lo que transforma el sonido desde el disco de, de vinilo hasta su proyección a través de este, esta como membrana. Oh, algo pasó. Esta membrana tipo parlante. Aquí todavía se ve. Bueno, eh, todas las cosas que están involucradas en la transmisión del sonido, están hechas de manera casera y hechas a mano. Es pura tecnología como autoaprendida y como te nosotros tenemos una, una palabra para definir este tipo de cosas, que la palabra es lo hechizo. No, no lo hechizo. hechizo. <risa> así, hechizo para así ti, como, un, como un spell. <risa> eh, se escriben igual, con H, con Z, Sí. No, pero no es un hechizo, sino que es lo hechizo, que es la gama de, 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 de tecnología creada eh, con medios eh, limitados y podría decirse no de forma casera, porque lo hechizo está presente en las cárceles, lo hechizo está presente como forma de, de, como de resistencia también. Eh, ¿Puedo retroceder? Sí. Sí. Sí, ahora. Sí. Ahora sí. Sí. Entonces estaba con eso y esta obra consiste en estas dos partes y yo lo veía como una forma de tomar el gramófono, como con la manivela, y tomar este cuerno y transformarlo en este otro parlante que era un espejo y un y esta otra parte que transforma el sonido de la aguja y lo va amplificando electromecánicamente a través de este, como esta botella de gas. Fue una improvisación material hasta llegar hasta el sonido que sale a través de esto, que era como un aullido fantasmagórico gigante. Entonces empecé a transformar, a transformar los materiales de esta forma y... Um, generar estas especies como de, de, de retratos de lugares de la ciudad, como de, de, de tomar materiales de una parte, articularlos, y el sonido de alguna forma me llevaba a cómo suenan estos lugares, o a relacionar un poco estos fantasmas de estos lugares con, con lo que es la precarización y el abandono, también que ocurría muy cerca de donde yo vivo. Y... De acuerdo, a, fui dividiendo en, di, en diferentes lugares, esto, esto se fue viendo y es una técnica que yo, no una técnica, pero un procedimiento que, con el que yo me mantuve a recoger material de desperdicio de la ciudad y construir estas esculturas. Que esta, por ejemplo, mucha gente me, me dijo, ah, ¿tú conoces a Jean Tangley? <risa> eh, precisamente porque era como muy vistosa en este mecanismo que tenía y esta en particular fue construida el año posterior al que yo tuve una residencia de 10 meses en Bogotá, en Colombia. La residencia se llamaba Flora Arts Natura y quizás algunos de ustedes conocen esa residencia. Um, y este espacio tenía una vitrina y yo gané una convocatoria para exponer en esa vitrina y construí esta máquina que consiste en un grabador y reproductor de cinta magnética construido en base a una rueda de... De, de, de auto que encontré en la calle y un montón de otros materiales de desperdicio y también una grabadora antigua, este trabajo en particular se llama The Scavenger justamente aludiendo al tema como de, de tratar de juntar recursos pero como la carroña como de yo siendo la persona que, eh, que es el carroñero que estoy un poco sobreviviendo eh, o mi práctica artística está sobreviviendo a través de reunir todos estos materiales precisamente porque son baratos, pero también tratando de hacer un comentario a cuál es la situación que está generando toda esta, esta situación. O sea, hay basura en la calle, 
hay pobreza, está este lugar que está como lleno de artistas, igual había una cosa ahí que me generaba ruido, que, que para mí era un poco una especie de conflicto tener una vitrina hacia adentro de, un, de una institución artística, pero atrás tuyo había una persona que está juntando cosas por, para poder sobrevivir, y eso me parecía muy fuerte también. Entonces lo que hacía esto es, era grabar en su superficie cubierta de cinta magnética eh, cosas del paisaje sonoro de la ciudad, eh, distintos momentos, eh, partes de programas variales, y los reproducía a través de la, de la ventana. La ventana funcionaba como, como micrófono y también funcionaba como, eh, como parlante de esta instalación. Entonces la gente podía ver y escuchar sin necesariamente entrar a la vitrina. Eh, esto fue en, el, en Antofagasta, en el norte de Chile. Esta obra se llama Hummingbird 3. La primera se llamaba Hummingbird 1 y la dos no la puse. Eh, y es un gramófono que funciona con el tiempo. Y justamente esto tenía que ver con repensar los espacios de, de, como patrimoniales de la ciudad. En este caso era el, el muelle Melbourne Clark de Antofagasta que fue muy importante en la historia de Chile por ser el lugar donde empezó la Guerra del Pacífico, un conflicto terrible que después no tuvo mucho sentido dentro, o sea, muchas cosas pasaron a través de, 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 de este conflicto, pero para la gente común como nosotros, eh, nosotros no llegamos a ver lo, la riqueza o las cosas que, que, que sucedieron a partir de esos conflictos. Entonces eso me pareció mucho, me, me pareció muy fuerte. Y um, decidí hacer esta obra que es justo dialoga con el tema como de las historias y, y los restos de no, las historias populares que eh, se borran de la memoria. De Entonces yo traje un video de esto. Ahora, que es esto y... Así. fantasmales y eso es una cosa que, que va o sea, que se va a seguir como repitiendo en mi trabajo eh, más adelante eh, ese era el video afuera. y creo que la última de las piezas que quería mostrar como a este respecto es esta que se llama triturador y fue construida en Valparaíso con los restos de una casa que fue incendiada precisamente por motivos de o sea, para desplazar a la gente, para poder construir en esos terrenos y empalpar los incendios eh, ocasionados eh, a propósito. Entonces, eh, yo tuve una residencia en Valparaíso, parte del Festival de Arte Sonoro Tsunami, que es muy importante en, en Chile y, y Latinoamérica, y han sido muy buenos de invitarme muchas veces a colaborar con ellos a construir eh, máquinas y justamente me encontré con esta casa que había sido incendiada y algunas personas me, me dejaron ocupar un poco de ese material para construir un aparato sonoro. Y justamente está basado en los eh, en tona ruido los intonarumori de Luigi Russolo, al menos el mecanismo, y de nuevo para tratar de activar el espacio a través del sonido ensorpecedor que tenía esta máquina. Esta no lo puse el registro sonoro de esto, me, me interesaba más como 
eh, mostrar más o menos cómo se usan las máquinas. Eh, me interesa también trabajar con el tema de la interactividad, pero no la interactividad hipertecnológica de que uno entra y todo empieza a pasar alrededor de uno. Me interesa como la interactividad bruta, como lo low tech, lo, como mover una manivela. Y lo interesante es que cuando mueves una manivela tienes que mover todo el cuerpo, tienes que usar tu peso, eh, tienes que es un poco que verte ridículo, es una forma un poco de, 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 de perder la dignidad y, 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 y activarte. También como tengo una reflexión en torno a eso de, 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 de por qué es importante moverse y perder como la faceta como, como digna que uno tiene, que, que uno quiere construirse o una imagen social que uno, que uno trata de construirse todo el tiempo. Eh, tengo esta otra serie de trabajos que es eh, aparecido. <ríe> de hecho, ahí está. Ahí está. <ríe> Eso estaba en la presentación de Adriana. Esta, esta serie de obras comencé a construirlas en Bogotá, en Colombia, también parte de esta residencia. Y son hechas a base de pantallas de cristal líquido de computadores encontrados en la basura. Tratando de hacer una especie de... de, de como de huella acuática o de paisaje abstracto que va a través de todos estos objetos, tratando de recuperar un poco de los conceptos de, de pintura que aprendí en algún momento. Esto fue como volver un poco a la abstracción y volver un poco a la contemplatividad, pero a través de este nuevo material que ya venía eh, como encontrando. Eh, esta pieza reaccionaba de esta forma, generaba interferencias eh, con los impulsos del viento que venían del exterior. Y mmm, después empecé a conectarlas con estas otras cosas que tienen que ver con tecnología intervenida, que es una impresora que sirve para dibujar. Es una... Aquí hay como otra de esas que construyen una serie muy grande que estoy haciendo de impresoras que dibujan. Un poco basada en los eh, autómatas que dibujan. Es como una especie de... Hacer, de yo, yo, yo llamo esto como una especie de aparato zombie. Eso es una definición que va apareciendo en muchas de mis obras. El aparato zombie para mí es como una tecnología reactivada a medias que, por ejemplo, imprime peor que una impresora y sirve para dibujar peor de lo que dibujas a mano. Es como una especie de galvanismo aplicado a... Eh, para los técnicos. Es una, como un limbo entre la funcionalidad de estos objetos. Esta fue exhibida aquí en Zurich, um, aquí en Suiza, en Zurich, hace unos dos años. Y un proyecto que estoy trabajando hace algún tiempo, desde que estoy en Colombia, pero ahora perfeccionado y que, y que me resultó muy útil para para trabajar mientras, estoy en, mientras estábamos en pandemia, es esta máquina que la construí yo mismo y sirve para grabar discos de vinilo. A mí me, me fascina mucho el tema del disco de vinilo. Eh, yo no soy un fan, ni, ni soy un melómano, y no soy como un nerd de los discos. Soy, soy una persona que se fascina por su calidad como, como escultura. O como un material que es capaz de guardar memoria pero no solo de guardar memoria, sino que también de perderla. Y eso me interesa mucho en el tema de... Me interesa mucho para hablar de temáticas de la memoria y también me interesa para hablar como de cómo la tecnología, la baja tecnología va generando de cierta forma como órganos artificiales. Que en algún momento eran algo que podría ser como casi acercando a la magia, acercando a una experiencia religiosa, acercando a una exper experiencia sobrenatural, pero lo tenemos tan internalizado que se vuelve parte de nuestro día a día hasta que ya termina en obsolescencia completa. Eh, entonces con esa máquina empecé a sa sacar ediciones de discos en colaboración con distintos artistas, y una de esas colaboraciones eh, tuvo que ver con un eh, artista de México, eh, con el que hicimos una residencia aquí en Appenzell, en para el que hice esta máquina de acá, que es otro tocadiscos activado por el viento. Y esto aquí es en Obrek, eh, durante la residencia de la biblioteca Andreas Just, 
y es muy cerquita de acá. Sí. Uno va a la estación de, de St. Gallen, toma el tren hacia Trogen y media hora después está este lugar, que es increíble. Aquí estaba nublado y eso es como cuando uno está nublado, como ese mar de nubes. Es increíble. Me pasó que yo llegué a Suiza con mi modus operandi, mi forma de hacer estas esculturas, y yo llego a Suiza y digo, ¿dónde está la basura? Y de alguna forma me obliga a tener que cambiar la forma en que, en que empiezo a producir mis obras. Y lo que sí hay, hay un paisaje eh, que es muy increíble, del que ya todos sabíamos desde hace mucho tiempo que existía, pero yo nunca pensé ser una persona que, que iba a llegar a Suiza en algún momento. Siempre dije, nunca voy a salir de Chile porque no hacíamos eso con mi familia. No teníamos ese, ese capital en mi familia. Fue por suerte que llegué acá. <risa> y entonces, eh, estar en, el, en este paisaje me pareció una experiencia demasiado fuerte y eso me motivó a seguir un poco explorando este tema de qué es lo que es medio eh, fuera de una experiencia totalmente terrenal. Entonces seguí coleccionando objetos acá y también seguí como tratando de hacer cosas como con los mínimos recursos posibles. Así que construí esta máquina que... Esta es la imagen que sale en, el, en la portada del workshop. Eh, me sirve un poco para ir conquistando terrenos eh, a través de su, su forma de ser como desplegable, como plegable y desplegable. Yo puedo ir con esta máquina hacia un paisaje, ponerla ahí y transformar el, el, el espacio sonoro con el que me encuentro. Y en uno de esos momentos eh, compré un disco, este es el video que hay que poner en la pregunta. <risa> Es muy interesante porque en un momento alguien me dijo, después de hacer esta intervención, que el yodel es una especie de diálogo, un canto hacia el viento, básicamente. Y hice, esta, hice esa máquina con un disco que encontré en, en un broqui. Ah, espera. Um, Hice esa máquina con un disco que encontré en un broqui y fue un poco más o menos repetir la experiencia que tuve en Antofagasta, en el norte de Chile, pero luego adecuado a este contexto y lo interesante es que con esta máquina ahora planeo eh, colaborar con más artistas que me van a dar su sonido para poder grabarlos en un disco de vinilo casero para ponerlos en la máquina y generando composiciones que son... Eh, pensadas específicamente para ser eh, tocados con la intervención del viento. O sea, si tú lo pones en un tocadiscos normal, está mal. Hay que, ser, hay que ponerlo en, en diálogo con el viento. Eh, entonces, aquí en Suiza, mi experiencia artística se transforma en una cosa mucho más compacta. 
y el año pasado empecé a hacer esta, este proyecto que se llama um, La balada de Robert Monslow, The Ballad of Robert Monslow, que es una máquina confesionaria. Eh, todo parte con el encuentro que tuve con esta grabadora de cinta magnética eh, transparente. Y lo que hice con esta máquina fue sacar el cabezal que borra la cinta antes de que tú puedas grabar. Y le puse un pequeño loop de cinta de 12 segundos adentro. Entonces esta máquina repite todo lo que se graba, pero es incapaz de borrar. Entonces la gente puede seguir estas instrucciones, grabar sus secretos, hacer la invitación, historias, lo que sea, confesiones. Y la máquina superponía todos los secretos uno encima de otro eh, y los mantenía secretos de esa forma, porque todo se superpone en un audio indescriptible, como algo que no se puede, no se puede entender. Esto estaba en el baño de una habitación de hotel, donde nos permitieron hacer una exposición, y el parlante de la exposición era este, que alude a una cama metálica que estaba haciendo que estaba transmitiendo el sonido a través del metal de estas, de estas cosas. Entonces era un sonido medio, medio infernal, medio, medio incómodo, súper eléctrico, súper metálico, de todas estas voces eh, siendo reproducidas todas al mismo tiempo. Me parecía muy interesante que el contexto también fuera una habitación de hotel donde todo se supone que alude a lo, a lo de... O sea, a la comodidad y al confort, y en este momento tienes esta que, se, que tiene una presencia súper violenta, aparte de que este tipo de camas también tuvieron un, un, un uso súper siniestro en dictaduras en Latinoamérica, tienen, tienen otro tipo de usos en las prisiones, eh, se pueden ser desarmadas para hacer armas hechizas, ese es un poco el, el contexto que me traigo de, de, de trabajar con estos objetos en, desde Latinoamérica. Um, y esta es la última obra que voy a presentar que de hecho la voy a exponer dentro de poco en, 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 en Basel en Kunstraum Rien eh, parte de las exposiciones de Regionale si sí, sí, hay alguna forma de mandar esa invitación um, y esta obra um, es un tríptico que tiene que ver sobre la memoria eh, y un poco sobre la, 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 como el amor fraternal, y tiene que ver con una anécdota de cuando yo me lesioné mi mano derecha cuando tenía siete años. Entonces, yo hace tiempo estaba buscando formas de, precisamente durante la pandemia, de estar presente en distintos lugares sin estar en esos lugares, así que me empecé a transformar, a, a armar unas especies de réplicas de mí mismo, una especie de autorretratos a través de máquinas que yo mismo iba uh, produciendo, con estos órganos artificiales de los que hablé en un momento. El aparato, el disco y el tocadiscos es como el record, es una palabra que, que, en, su, que en su esencia tiene algo que ver con el corazón. Recordar significa volver a pasar por el corazón. Entonces, yo grabando una historia en este disco y volviendo a repetirla una y otra vez, eh, tenía que ver con ese, con ese tema como de generar una cicatriz, una herida en el material e ir borrándola y borrándola hasta que la memoria de lo que fue grabado se vuelve demasiado imprecisa, hasta que ya no se puede escuchar. O al menos esa era la idea, porque estoy ensayando los materiales en ese, en ese aspecto y sí ocurre una transformación eh, en estos discos que grabo yo de manera artesanal. El globo plateado que se ve en la instalación tiene más o menos mi altura y es el que cuenta la historia, es el parlante de la instalación. Entonces flota y te puedes acercar y escuchar el murmullo de lo que, de lo que sale por el disco. Y la otra pieza es una especie de autómata que tiene las medidas de mi mano derecha eh, que se va moviendo constante y lentamente eh, con el paso del tiempo. Eh, están conectadas las tres obras y la historia sobre cómo me, me lastimé la mano es también una historia de cómo mi hermana me enseñó que 
los dedos de la mano se mueven como si fueran eh, como activados por un como pulling the strings entonces tiene que ver con esa cercanía con mi hermana, tiene que ver con las cicatrices de cómo los días fríos a veces nos recuerdan como algunas ciertas heridas del pasado hablo de cómo tengo cicatrices en, en mis muñecas pero por accidentes estúpidos que tuve cuando era de cuando era un niño y cómo duelen cuando pasan las estaciones del año eh, ¿cómo se llama? y eso básicamente, en el, en, aparte de esta escultura, en el sonido también están las versiones de la misma historia de cómo me lesioné la mano de parte de mis hermanos. Y ellos tienen una, una versión totalmente distinta de la historia, en que ellos son totalmente inocentes y yo soy el culpable. Y la pieza termina con un loop del disco de mi hermana diciendo, no me acuerdo, todo el tiempo, hasta que vuelva a iniciar el disco. Eh, son las tres historias, están en tres idiomas distintos y, y, y ese es mi, como un puntapié para pensar futuras obras relacionadas con la memoria, ya involucrando más personas, involucrando gente de distintos contextos y gente que me quiera regalar también sus propias historias. Y eso sería todo. Gracias, Rodrigo. La pieza está en Apitzel. Apitzel. ¿Tienes un colega en Apitzel? No. Ah, eh... No, no, no. Ah. Yo digo que tienes un... Que... <risa> sí. A quien también le da vergüenza, que también, como dijiste, pierde la dignidad, se siente ridículo. Le daba vergüenza cuando hacía sus experimentos. O sea, experimentaba, tú dices, improvisabas con materiales. Él experimenta con materiales. ¿Quién es? <risa> Porque... <risa> o Mancino. Ah. Sí. Él es de Appenzell y él Exacto. dice, claro, es una estrella mundial, pero le da vergüenza lo que está haciendo, mm. <risa> sus acciones. Eso me, me gustó mucho, o sea, lo de, la, de perder la dignidad. Pero también lo tuyo de activar el espacio con el sonido es, es interesante. Um, también la... la, la y tengo dos, uh, tenemos dos proyectos aquí en este edificio que se parecen. Uno es el concierto de vasos. Un artista regional dio a varios estudiantes y al rector también un vaso de flores. Ella filmaba desde el suelo hacia el techo, este techo acústico, porque también tiene que ver ¿no? la acústica del techo con los encajes de sangre. Ella filmó de, de, de abajo y todos tenían que cantar en el vaso, o sea, usar el cuerpo de resonancia del vaso y hacer cantar, cantar en el vaso, todos, 12, 14, etc. Y él, ella lo filmó. O sea, esto es una obra y la segunda es de un artista de Londres que recolecta materiales de plástico de toda la universidad, es decir, de cualquier oficina, de la mensa, de cualquier lugar, y va a montar una, un aparato muy sofisticado, o sea, nada de low-tech, o sea, si lo ves, tienes el, la idea de que es un, un aparato bastante, o sea, electrónico, bastante sofisticado, de dos metros por dos metros por dos metros. Todo, o sea, ha recolectado plástico durante un año uh, aquí. O sea, y es, los dos estarán aquí en este edificio. Y me parece bonito que sí, hayas... Sí, sí que, hayas, que hayas... A ver, comentarios. Adrián. Bueno, en realidad tengo mil, mil preguntas y mil comentarios. Porque, <risa> bien, ahora sí, estamos... Eh, digamos, afinando un poco más el, el proyecto este primero sobre residuos y yo estoy trabajando sobre basura. Sí. Con lo cual, bueno, hay muchísimas cosas que tienen que ver evidentemente con, con este proceso que nosotros vamos llamando estetización de la basura o basurización del arte y que de alguna manera conecta otra vez con esa idea de precariedad de los latinoamericanos, eh, de pobreza, etcétera, etcétera. Eh, y eh, hay dos cosas que me, que me, 
interesa. ¿A dónde van a parar o a dónde fueron a parar todas esas primeras piezas hechas con basura? O con un desecho, digamos. Es un desecho técnico, pero de una tecnología, digamos, fracasada. Bueno, una... ¿a dónde fueron parar? a parar después de haber hecho, sido convertidas en, en, en arte? Eh, la respuesta está como entre medio de las eh, como diapositivas también porque no sé si viste que la, la obra con la rueda que se activa con la manivela es la misma de manivela que estaba en la primera obra ah, no me di cuenta. Eh, el, como el, ese como horn como de, de, de la obra con la manivela es parte de la como obra que también estaba en Antofagasta, en el es como metal reciclado también. Y al final, toda esa obra de la, de, la, de la manivela la compró el Estado chileno. Así que está en una colección y de ahí no se va a desarmar más. O sea, está desarmada, pero espero que no, no vuelvan a reciclar las partes para otra cosa. O sí. No. Y eso sería bueno. Es lo que haces tú, un doble reciclaje. Claro. Pero muchas de esas cosas eh, terminaron transformándose en, en muebles para otras cosas que iba haciendo o, o para mis estudios en el futuro. O sencillamente fui como desarmando, aprovechando. Tengo cajas con partes, tengo circuitos que voy desarmando. En algún momento alguien me dijo, para de destruir tus obras. Y, y creo que en ese momento también fue cuando todo empezó a compactarse también y hacerse plegable y desplegable. Eh, entonces, harto tiene que ver con eso. Mi mamá tiene, tiene mi, mayor, la, la, mi mayor colección. Sí. Eh, muchas cosas están en su casa, en Santiago. Algunas cosas están en, en, en Bogotá, también eh, distribuidos entre amigos, pero... No puede haber un, una, una charla de arte latinoamericano sin mencionar a las camas. Eso, eso, eso me parece un poco raro que no se haya mencionado. Pero, es, es, era invaluable. Sí. Hay otra, pero ya es más bien una, una, un dato. No sé si tú sabes que en el que en el Caribe, en los momentos grandes de crisis, y particularmente en Cuba, pero también en la Unión Soviética, el material que se usaba para el vinilo no era el vinilo, sino eran las placas. Sí, sí, sí. Eh, y es un material que me parece súper interesante, porque básicamente está sacado, son las placas utilizadas, las que normalmente se tiran a la basura y son hipertóxicas. Sí. Pero en algún momento... Es inflamable. Eh, e inflama y muy inflamable, pero en algún momento, por falta de vinilo, se empezó a grabar en las placas, y es un material realmente muy interesante en su relación con el, con el sonido, pero también en su relación como un dispositivo de algo muy particular, que es el cuerpo, la experiencia del cuerpo, y el horror de tener que estar parado ahí delante de rayos. Es decir, no sé hasta qué punto lo sabías, y bueno, cómo se está... Eh, ese, ese tema... Trabajé mucho alrededor de ese tema porque yo quería hacer mis propias eh, placas de... Eh, ellos se refieren como al X-Ray, uh -huh. que fue grabado como, como disco en la, en la Unión Soviética. Y no solo eso que venía de, la, de, 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 de las placas de rayos X, sino que también era bueno que era flexible porque se podía enrollar para tenerlo oculto, para poder eh, como smuggle. Eh, música en contextos donde estaba prohibido. Eh, ¿Cómo se llama? Esos le llaman Bone Records. Y una de mis primeras motivaciones para construir esa máquina fue para hacer mis propios Bone Records. Después me di cuenta de que la placa de X-Ray es, suena infinitamente mal. Pero, pero eso también más tiene gruesas. que ver. Antes eran mucho sí. gruesas. Tiene que ver con que. Eh, ¿Cómo se llama? era barato y se generó toda una, no, no una industria, pero como una cultura de gente que creció escuchando música occidental y especializándose en música a través de las melodías precarias que venían en este, en este espacio. Y me pareció interesantísimo. Empecé a construir esa máquina también con la, 
ambición de poder hacer regalos de Navidad económicos. Y ha sido el proyecto más largo y más time consuming de todos los que he hecho. Pero en algún momento espero tener una especie de sello discográfico experimental, el material experimental de cosas. Bien, gracias. latinoamericano, o sea, que, que periferia, que descentralización o no, hay mucho. Acaba de, da, de indicarme otra vez, Tomás, que aquí hay 300 artistas, muchas mujeres, o sea, hay, es, hay esperanza, o sea, vamos a por el boom, ¿no? O sea. Y un, um, un amigo de, de Chile, que fue mi primer empleo, que trabajé con Sebastián Calfuqueo. Que está que está aquí en el... sí. O sea, 300 artistas no pocas. Uh, después, um, o sea, estamos cerca de un auge uh, de, de atención, no digo boom, pero un auge de atención hacia el arte latinoamericano. Ahora no sé qué han podido sacar del día, seguro que hemos husmeado, schnuppen, Uh, uh, en, 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 en la red, en el networking y uh, claro, ya se han visto los vasos comunicantes varios, ¿sí? o sea, hay muchas líneas uh, de conexión ya, la, el último, el de, de su arte y, y tu basura, o sea, uh, está claro. <risa> Y también espero que algo les sirva el primer contacto con Betty Sánchez, porque es un potencial, hay un potencial ahí uh, también. Um, y uh, no sé si la, sus impresiones, si quieren compartirlas, después vamos a terminar la comida, <ríe> que no hay food waste, no hay basura. <ríe> y los que tienen alguna energía, de sobra, eh, les puedo hacer el tour, un tour guiado breve, pero les puedo hacer el tour para que vean algunas obras. Yo solo quería comentar que a mí me alegra mucho que aquí ciencia en un lugar que no se encuentra mucho. Y primeramente, como muy alumbrada de que un artista se puede expresar así didácticamente de su arte, porque hay artistas que ese tema no les dicen que no y no, no quieren explicar y como que realmente fascinante. Y me recordó también de una profesora que yo tenía que ella nos mostró ejemplos de la tradición de colonial eh, que trabajaron eh, científicos con artistas porque se dieron cuenta que los artistas intuitivamente en la práctica reflexionaron el pensamiento mundial. Entonces reflexionaron, hicieron arte y, y querían como ver las cosas y ellos con sus conceptos trataban de, digamos, eh, entenderlo más. Me pareció muy interesante cómo tu localidad se transformó a través de tu arte, que era la pregunta que surgió hoy, de desde qué localidad habla uno, ¿no? Entonces tu arte... Era un poco diferente cuando llegaste a Suiza, tú mismo lo notaste, ¿no? Pero es que no, no era un arte, digamos, que lo hubiera hecho quizás un Suiza, sino como que tú hablaste todavía de un lugar, ¿no? Entonces, eso, por ejemplo, a mí me pareció muy interesante verlo en la misma forma como lo explicaste, eh, como un ejemplo de la localidad y cómo uno habla de esa, de que, por ejemplo, yo siendo Suiza, ¿no? Uno tiene privilegio. Hay pocas personas que están conscientes del privilegio que tiene y entonces, ¿qué implica eso? No? Cuando uno tiene tanto privilegio, como que no se enseña a las personas cómo actuar cuando uno tiene todo eso. Es como es más fácil, quizás, ya sabe, ir en contra de los que tienen privilegio, pero ¿qué hace uno cuando tiene todo ese privilegio? Entonces, es diferente la localidad de cual uno habla y, y entonces también la forma de, de actuar. Y a mí me pareció muy, muy interesante. Muchas gracias por tu parte. ¿Otros comentarios? ¿Cómo? Sí, por favor. Este, bueno, ya tuve el gusto de, de platicar hace ratito. Este, en general, fue, bueno, yo tengo igual que el tema médico de la plástica, que yo vengo de México. Aquí 
aquí en el cantón de Zúrich. Eh, y sí, me comentas, no es fácil, ¿no? Es eh, uno eh, mmm, tiene que también, esa parte de inventiva, eh, según también en relación a tus, a tus, eh, pues sí, a, a, ¿cómo se dice? A tus, este, a tus recursos, tienes que reinventarte, ¿no? Yo también lo pensé en un momento, uno tal vez cuando está en su país, tiene ciertas limitantes de recursos, muy aparte de donde vienes, o, o, o como hayas crecido, y otra también cuando sales fuera, ¿no? A veces no puedes llevar la pieza grande, tienes que reinventarte, tienes que pensar más, y, y, y luego las perspectivas de otra gente que conoces, o te, los, los consejos que te dan, es muy como muy nutritivo, ¿no? Creo que al, bueno, yo estoy como muy emocionado y contento de poder escuchar diferentes puntos de vista desde el contexto académico, pero también desde, como comentaba, desde el contexto también como, como, como artista. Y que, lo que también me, me hubiese gustado, claro, comentaste que nunca pensaste que ibas a llegar acá. Fue como una casualidad. Así como tú pienso que también hay mucha gente que está aquí, de diferentes nacionalidades, como en este caso de América Latina, este, que tienen diferentes circunstancias y llegaron a esta, ¿no? ya sea desde el contexto, desde una, eh, buscar una, en la universidad este, eh, ese, ese chance de poder este, estar acá y luego se hicieron las cosas, otros pues tal vez por alguna otra circunstancia, llegar aquí, pero nuevamente reactivarte, eso es como muy interesante, no sé, me gustaría escucharte. Eh, ahora, ¿cómo te sientes ya estando después de, de, tan, de tre, me comentas que tres años, estar aquí? ¿Y cuál es tu, tu punto de vista o perspectiva como artista latinoamericano? Ya, porque ya estás produciendo aquí, ya estás, en, eh, me imagino que ya trabajando aquí también. ¿Tú cómo te sientes también? Sé que no es un proceso fácil, ¿no? Sí, no, no es un proceso para nada fácil. Y como te conté hace un rato, en un momento uno se trae como una mochila de conocimientos que adquirió quizás en la escuela de arte, o, en, o sea, principalmente los de la escuela de arte, son los que uno llega acá y te dicen como, es todo totalmente distinto a como lo esperaba. Y, y que el arte suizo es muy distinto al, al arte que se hace allá, y el que se enseña, y cómo se enseña, y todo eso. Entonces también hay un choque al que uno tiene que adaptarse. Y en esa búsqueda de reinventar lo que traigo, usando un poco de lo que me sirve, y también como ignorando algunas cosas que no quiero donde no quiero como modificar mi, mi cosa es que estoy siempre tratando de producir no, no es como perdón como perder no perder tu, tu identidad porque suele pasar que muchos se pierden no y tienen bueno tú sabes que en la escuela no sé por lo menos en la escuela de México tiene toda nuestra formación es sí eurocentrista no sí, el pensamiento sí, sí. ¿no? en Chile también y romper eso cuesta yo sé que también no, no la mayoría de muchos que estamos allá y cualquier eh, carrera nos cuesta salir, sí. ¿no? Y luego romper eso, o más que romper, tener una visión un poquito más amplia cuesta, ¿no? Eh, o tener la oportunidad de poder salir fuera del país, como lo comentaste también, es para, para nosotros es nada sencillo, ¿no? Simplemente estás pensando desde el pasaje. Claro. El pasaje es, es, es muy caro, sí. ¿no? Eh, lo comentabas tú que... Este, pues sí, desde tu perspectiva es, es, es otra, otra, otra visión, ¿no? Sí. Pero nosotros que venimos del, del otro lado literal del charco, no es tan sencillo. Y luego de sí, y está el idioma, y está Exacto. todo, y está tratar de dejar una escena de la que eras parte para tratar de meterse en otra. Hay que decir que yo estudié en Zurich y la, la escena no es la más simpática de, 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 de todos los sí, sí. tampoco, pero está la comunidad latina que está alrededor de la cápsula, por ejemplo, que, que, es, un, es, que es, un, es como un salvavidas dentro de todo eso, pero sigue siendo un salvavidas. O sea, sí. hay que construir un barco. Creo que es eso. No sé cómo sea en Suiza, pero por lo menos nosotros en América Latina, bueno, creo que también me da mucho gusto. Yo he conocido a gente de artistas en Suiza que, que me llevo muy bien, son latinoamericanos, intentamos hacer hasta cierto punto comunidad. Claro, cada quien tiene sus, sus pros y sus contras o sus personalidades, como todo, ¿no? Hay gente con sus egos y todo, ¿no? Claro. Pero intentamos hacer como comunidad para hacer proyectos también un poquito más eh, versátiles, porque todos tienen al fin y al cabo puntos de vista diferentes y pues conocimiento que compartir. Y creo que también por eso vine, ¿no? Para poder aprender un poco más. 
¿no? Y, y ampliar un poquito y mira, conocer sí. a... Final, a Adrián. Sí, pero es, es solamente, de nuevo, por la cuestión del, del para aquí, para allá, de, de, de la meditación, del ir y vol volver, hay una, una de las frases que, que más he escuchado, yo he trabajado bastante sobre meditación y sobre todo sobre el volver. Eh, y una de las frases que siempre me llamó la atención y que sigue saliendo por la cuestión de mi trabajo con la basura, es que muchos migrantes hablaban de sí o hablaban de la migración en términos de reciclaje. Claro. Es decir, de algo realmente material que eh, regresa a esa materialidad, materialidad pura del cuerpo, de la experiencia, pero que se digamos, se rehace en un contexto nuevo. Y me parece súper importante o súper interesante también porque tú estás trabajando precisamente a modo de un proceso constante de reutilización o, o reciclaje. Y sí, era, una, era para volver un poco también a, a esta relación entre una experiencia vivida eh, como reciclaje, según una sí. gran cantidad de migrantes, y al trabajo que estás haciendo. Sí. ¿Tú, tú, tú conoces a... No sé si conoces personalmente a Ernesto Orosa, no. que él investiga arte y documenta como artes de las soluciones, como por ejemplo las que se hacen en Cuba para suplir como la, la, la falta de objetos de uso cotidiano, etc. Y hablamos justamente de esto, de, de, del tema de si es reciclaje o no, y es como, eh, generalmente uno piensa que reciclaje tiene que ver como con la, con la, con la ecología o como con las cosas así, pero en este caso son cosas mucho más nocivas para el cuerpo y para la naturaleza cuando uno tiene que usar ciertas eh, soluciones para subsistir. Y en mi caso, yo no estoy haciéndolo para subsistir, pero trabajar con esto me trae muchos problemas. Solo resuelve la, como la, compra, la compra de materiales, de obtener motorcitos, de obtener cosas, de obtener metal, madera barato, pero... Me, me, quemo los, me quemo las pestañas, me corto los dedos, me pasan un montón de cosas precisamente por trabajar con esto. Y no es cómodo, no es... Eh, pero es como lo que aprendí a hacer. Por eso sigo como... No sé si para mí tampoco es como reciclaje. Es como... No, 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 no sé cómo llamarlo, pero tiene que ver con eso de, la, de, de, de subsistir. Es lo que sé hacer ahora, al final. Bien, muchas gracias. Hay red, ya. Yeah. Minúscula, modesta, pero hay red. De la parte alemana de Suiza. O sea, ya algo es algo. O sea, de ahí partimos. Muchas gracias por haber venido.